I would like to congratulate EMSA, the, the Maritime Agency, with its anniversary. 20 years, it's, it's already an important step. 20 years, it's a, a young organization, but it has proved to be a very uh, active organization, an active agency. I would like to congratulate Maya and the whole team, because I also think that it's very important that now EMSA is not looking at maritime as such, but is also understanding that maritime without ports is not possible. So every ship has to come to arrive and to leave from a port. So congratulations and see you soon in Lisbon. Dear EMSA Director General and colleagues, dear Maya, in recent years, shipping specific legislative activities have skyrocketed with the Fit for 55 package on maritime decarbonisation and the review of the third maritime safety package to name but two. In all these work streams, the European Maritime Safety Agency plays an absolutely pivotal role in ensuring that the emerging and evolving legislation develops in a safe and technically sound manner. The EU's establishment of such an excellent body of expertise 20 years ago was far-sighted. In only two decades, EMSA has reached a remarkable level of maturity, whose work benefits the entire maritime community on a daily basis. IACS looks forward to working with EMSA for the next 20 years and beyond as a partner towards safer, cleaner shipping. And we wish the agency and its outstanding people a well-deserved birthday celebration. Let us first uh, recap for a moment the history. European Maritime Safety Agency was established in 2002 in the aftermath of the two dramatic accidents both of which had a catastrophic impact on millions of people. I would like to congratulate EMSA, the, the Maritime Agency, with its anniversary. 20 years, it's, it's already an important step. 20 years, it's a, a young organization, but it has proved to be a very uh, active organization, an active agency. I would like to congratulate Maya and the whole team because I also think that it's very important that now EMSA is not looking at maritime as such, but is also understanding that maritime without ports is not possible. So every ship has to come to arrive and to leave from a port. So congratulations and see you soon in Lisbon. Dear EMSA Director General and colleagues, Dear Maya, in recent years, shipping specific legislative activities have skyrocketed with the Fit for 55 package on maritime decarbonisation and the review of the third maritime safety package to name but two. In all these work streams, the European Maritime Safety Agency plays an absolutely pivotal role in ensuring that the emerging and evolving legislation develops in a safe and technically sound manner. The EU's establishment of such an excellent body of expertise 20 years ago was far-sighted. In only two decades, EMSA has reached a remarkable level of maturity, whose work benefits the entire maritime community on a daily basis. IACS looks forward to working with EMSA for the next 20 years and beyond as a partner towards safer, cleaner shipping. And we wish the agency and its outstanding people a well-deserved birthday celebration. Let us first uh, recap for a moment, the history. European Maritime Safety Agency was established in 2002 in the aftermath of the two dramatic accidents, both of which had a catastrophic impact on millions of people, as well as the environment along the EU's Atlantic coastline. Today, EMSA offers high-tech maritime surveillance, comprehensive training curricula, and a wide portfolio of services to enhance the work of maritime administrations. It has become a known and much appreciated player globally and is working with countries all over the world. Thanks to EMSA, we are also better equipped and prepared for any future accidents, even though I sincerely hope we do not have to test that. So yes, EMSA was a game changer and can help us to deal with current challenges in particular in supporting the maritime sector to become more sustainable by addressing the challenges of climate change that are in the forefront of our transport and mobility agenda.
being the one and only EU level maritime safety body makes it special by definition. But most importantly, they are the very dedicated, highly skilled and committed people who work for EMSA in order to make our seas and maritime transport safer for all. That makes EMSA really special. Well, it is yes and no. Maritime safety remains always our number one priority and the core task of EMSA. From that perspective, we need to continue on the same path as during the last 20 years and to make sure our ability to provide highest level of safety is never compromised. However, 20 years is a long time. A lot around us has changed and we are all faced with new challenges and new realities. It's clear that the maritime sector brings substantial economic and social benefits, but it also has an impact on the environment and the air quality. These topics are now in the forefront of European policy agenda and maritime sector has to do its important part. At the same time, we must also simplify the regulatory framework in the maritime sector, for example, by reduction of the reporting burdens, supporting quick and easy data exchange and accelerating the shift towards digitalization. We have already kicked off the revision of the agency's mandate to ensure it has the right tools to deliver on these new challenges. I look forward to many more decades of the agency supporting us in the delivery as we work towards safer, more sustainable, smarter and resilient maritime sector. Let me quote here Mark Twain. Catch the trade winds in your sails. Explore, dream, discover. Happy birthday, Emza. Upwards and onwards with fair winds and following seas. Let us celebrate together. Congratulations to Executive Director Maya Markovic Kosarak and the uh, entire team of EMSA uh, for the 20 years of successful uh, operation. It's indeed a great celebration and it's a great honor for me uh, to send you um, this uh, anniversary wishes on behalf of the European Union Satellite uh, Center, especially since uh, we are celebrating ourselves uh, 30 years uh, anniversary this year. I'm proud to look back to many years of fruitful collaboration uh, with the EMSA and uh, we are very interested in further developing uh, this uh, into an even more effective uh, partnership uh, in the future. The maritime security that um, you have been upholding and improving uh, all these uh, years can widely benefit from earth observation uh, which is such an activity we share a common vision to further develop uh, this security for the eu for its member states and for the citizens and we will always be ready to bring our competences in support to your mission we wish you fair wind and fair seas also for the next 20 years Dear colleagues at the European Maritime Safety Agency, it is with great pleasure that I congratulate you on the 20th anniversary of EMSA on behalf of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Happy birthday to our European colleagues in Lisbon from the ECDC team here in Stockholm. Our agencies are located as far from each other in Europe as it is possible geographically. We have nevertheless worked together very successfully guarding the health and safety of Europe and Europeans on the sea. This is where our missions intersect and we look forward to continued collaboration. It is not only human health and the seas that our agencies have in common. In our various remits we work with digitalization, responding to new emerging threats, capacity building, training and fostering partnerships in Europe and internationally. This is what it means to be building Europe. May you have fair winds and following seas as you steer forward 
towards safer seas, cleaner oceans, simpler and better shipping. There is an important dimension that we at the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control would like to add to your birthday wishes. Good health to all EMSA staff, friends and family. And better health to us all. Happy birthday, EMSA, and thank you for making navigation safer in Europe. We in Ayala are very happy for the close cooperation we have had with you during the last 14 years. EMSA is a member of Ayala and you participate very actively in our work with a similar focus, safety and efficiency of navigation. We hope to continue and strengthen this partnership with you now you are grown up, 20 years old. Hope to see our EMSA friends soon here in Paris. A very happy 20th birthday to the European Maritime Safety Agency, EMSA. EMSA is an important partner for Europol and staff from across our organization wish you the very best as you commemorate this milestone. EMSA works with Europol to tackle urgent problems arising from international organized crime, especially terrorism and migrant smuggling and other forms of serious crime. Information and services provided by EMSA are used in analysis projects across Europol's five crime centers. Our experts liaise throughout the year for training, for operational matters and to deepen our partnership. This is made possible by a working agreement between our two agencies signed in 2018 and we are glad to be working with EMSA as partners in the name of European citizen security. So, happy birthday EMSA, here's to another 20 years. Ms. Maya Makovcic Costella, Executive Director of EMSA. Mr. Andreas Nordseth, the Chairman of the EMSA Administrative Board. The board members and staff of EMSA, as well as technical experts. It gives me great pleasure to bring a congratulatory message to EMSA for 20 years of dedicated an excellent service to the global maritime community. Since its establishment in 2002, EMSA has grown into an impactful agent of change and development in the European Union and beyond, excelling in the key areas of strategy, sustainability, surveillance, safety, security, and simplification in the maritime industry. EMSA has been indeed a great success story. The World Maritime University itself set up as an international center of excellence for capacity building identifies strongly with EMSA's work in this respect. We treasure the various collaborations we have had with EMSA over the past 20 years, ranging from student field studies to EMSA headquarters, lectures by EMSA technical experts, WMU support to EMSA for a number of very significant projects, as well as fellowships for WMU students under the EU project funding implemented through EMSA. We applaud the meaningful and considerable role that EMSA plays in the maritime industry and how in its collaboration with many key stakeholders, it epitomizes the spirit of goal 17, revitalize global partnership for sustainable development of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals on partnership. To all at EMSA, the Chairman of the EMSA Administrative Board, Mr. We're okay. Right. So we kick off our second day of our conference. Today we are looking at innovation. And for that, we have a really interesting panel in front of us. And 
I just hand over in the capable hands of our chair of our executive, sorry, of our administrative board, Andreas Norset. Andreas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning to everyone. I was a bit concerned that after the fantastic party yesterday, Maya, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I was, uh, and it, it became quite, quite late. So I was a bit concerned how many will show up, but everybody's here, so that's very good. We have a fantastic panel on uh, innovation uh, and future opportunities. Everybody speaks about innovation, but we will try to make a deep dive with this fantastic panel into, so where do we need to innovate? And why do we need to innovate? And what are the barriers, options, possibilities? So we have a fantastic panel here with uh, starting from here, uh, Mr. Aaron Ferruccia, Minister of Transport, uh, Infrastructure and Capital Projects at Malta, welcome. We have Mr. Talis Linkeitz, Minister of Transport of the Republic of Latvia. Uh, we have uh, let, Dario B Dario Bocchetti, Manager of Energy Saving and Innovation Department from the Grimaldi Group. We have Ms. Isabel Rigbost, Secretary General for European Seaports Organization, the ESPO. And then we have uh, Mr. Christoph Tsukat, Secretary General of Shipyards and Maritime Equipment in EC Europe. And last but not least, Linda Bau, uh, Head of the Department for Safety, Security and Surveillance in Names. So let's give them a big hand as welcome. So, just to warm up for everybody, uh, I will ask you to hook on to Slido, uh, like you did yesterday, and we will ask you a question uh, to get your mindset on innovation. And uh, the question goes, in which areas of the maritime sector do we need more innovation? So let's see what comes up. It's a very strong brainstorm. It's absolutely quiet. <laughs> now it starts. Yeah. And as it gets started, you can see that it's actually a very broad set of areas. It looks like that there are a few of the topics that really, really takes on attention, decarbonization being the absolute biggest one. Okay, we'll give it uh, just, I think, 10 seconds more, and then we will turn to the panel and hear a few reflections on this. Yeah. So a lot of things already here on the table, but now we will turn to the panel, and uh, I will go to the minister from Malta and first ask you, minister, if you look at this, uh, do you have anything, uh, maybe one or two points to add? And could you maybe elaborate on why you think that it's important to innovate and also in the issues that you think that should be innovated on? So thank you for having me here, Chair. I would like to thank Maya for organizing this wonderful event, especially yesterday evening, to celebrate uh, EMSA's birthday, the 20th anniversary. And I have two provisos to start with. I am going to be more political than technical, being a politician myself. And secondly, I've been in my job for less than 100 days, so I'm not that much into the sector. Having said that, I'm, I was minister for the environment and climate change in the past three years, so I bring something to the table. But back, back to our discussion on innovation. First of all, I would like to, to congratulate Mr. Bocchetti from the Grimaldi Group, because most of the times we talk about what we should be doing 
And this is what we're doing. Mr. Mr. Bocchetti from the Grimaldi Group have just inaugurated, I would say, the greenest ship ever uh, in Malta. It's called Ecomalta, in fact. And I would like to congratulate them for, for the in, innovative way, the investment, the creativity, and the commitment they are giving to, to the sector itself. Now, of course, um, I would say that the shipping industry, from what I've learned in my first 100 days, is quite a conservative industry. And I don't think we should have any delusions of grandeur. I would say that there should be a balance. We, st we strike a balance between what is desirable, and that's what I guess we're going to discuss today, and what is doable. So both the politicians to the engineers out there, they should meet together and discuss the desirable and the doable, and then chart a way forward. Because what the industry needs, and not just the politicians and, and, and the government, but also the private sector, is stability. And that's what EMSA brings to the table. So yesterday, I, I answered that question we had in the first panel. And my, my, my one world um, uh, featuring in, in my mind was stability. This is what EMSA brings, stability in, in the sector itself. So those are my first comments. Of course, um, my other question is, why innovate? Why fix something that is working? And because we have to. That is the answer. And I will tell you why. First of all, it is economic survival. So first of all, we've been through it. COVID-19, the pandemic, then the war in Ukraine, and the economy strained to survive. So economic survival, um, competitiveness, economies of scale, I would say, are, are crucial. Um, and we have to innovate because competitiveness is important. And when I say competitiveness, it's not just between us, European Union member states, but also with third countries. And we have to be very careful not to move out um, you know, uh, the industry outside of the European Union. So that's number one. Number two, of course, decarbonization. It is the, the, the word featuring in, in that um, uh, answer. And I would say Fit for 55, ETS, I, I've been there, I know it. Um, it's going to be hard. It's, going to, it's a big challenge, especially for um, this industry, which is quite conservative. So yes, sustainable fuels, uh, green ships and all that. Um, that is the way to innovate. And the third is what the people need and what the people want. Um, we, we've been here already. The people want it here. The people want it now. And shipping is part of the supply chain, of course. So we have to innovate to move things fast. I've, I, I, I've served in Malta's free port. It is Malta's free trade zone for, for four years. I was a CEO there. And I've seen these ships growing larger and larger. Why? Economies of scale. You know, um, so this is the future. This is the innovation part of it. And um, my last comment, if I may, is that it's not just innovating in the shipping industry itself, but also the maritime infrastructure. They have to go hand in hand. For example, in Malta, we're, we're investing 50 million euro of EU funds in the short to ship project, plug and play. Um, and that is very important. So I think we have to no innovate not just the ships themselves, but also the infrastructure that comes with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's roll the ball uh, to uh, to uh, the Latvian minister, Minister uh, Linkait. Uh, how? What's your perspective? Uh, do you share the decarbonisation, and we need to put people together, or where are you in this? Yeah, good morning, everyone. And uh, first of all, I would like still to convey uh, best greetings to EMSA from the Latvian maritime community. We really appreciate your work that has been done over 20 years and looking forward to, to the same and even better uh, operations. But uh, if we speak about uh, the topic of innovation, I think innovation is something that happens every day. Every day we are thinking how to make things better, more, more usable, more uh, customer friendly, and the same about uh, maritime industry. Maritime industry, as, as my colleague said, it has to stay competitive, not only in Europe, but also worldwide. It has to be attractive for seafarers, uh, uh, especially uh, for the younger generation, uh, how to get uh, more uh, younger generation on board uh, in our industry. For that, you have to have uh, uh, more sophisticated, more um, modern fleet, you need modern solutions, you need uh, 
uh, automated solutions. Um, and then, uh, of course, all the uh, external uh, challenges that uh, comes uh, uh, in our daily life, it's a climate change, we have to be uh, carbon neutral. There are uh, already uh, targets uh, set by, by our uh, European Commission and Parliament and our societies, how they would like to see the shipping industry. Uh, the same about uh, all the current legislation, what we are discussing now, the Fit for 55 package, quite uh, uh, quite challenging, for, especially for small countries, for countries that do not have such uh, large pockets of, of money available. And it's also challenging for industry to, to, to uh, can we follow the speed that legislators would like to have? Uh, um, so these are all um, uh, very relevant uh, issues, and I think EMSA already has been doing uh, and advising and, and sharing best practices uh, uh, during these years. And I think uh, here, uh, here uh, it's important that we learn from each other, so we not uh, develop a new, uh, new bicycle from the beginning. So we learn from each other, and EMSA here would be, would be very uh, like a, a communicator, like uh, uh, the institution that is sharing these best practices and uh, being a framework of uh, of uh, discussions and uh, and learning from each other thank you thank you so uh, mr Pukhetsi, i understand that you represent the uh, primaldi group which i understand it has already started a lot of innovations on the green transition and so what's your take is there anything else we need to do and and why do we need to do it why do you need to innovate there is a lot to do, but uh, first uh, let me also congratulate with, uh, with EMSA for uh, the 20 years uh, anniversary and uh, the beautiful um, event organizer. We really, as a European ship owner, uh, we operate uh, about 150 vessels and we fully recognize uh, the importance uh, and, uh, of EMSA and uh, the knowledge, I would say, that uh, you have brought into the sector helping the European Commission in that. So, and uh, then, um, thanks also to the to the minister. And uh, yes, we have just, uh, let's say, de delivered the, this program of new building. They are about uh, 20 ships. Uh, 12 of those are hybrid uh, Roro. It means that they have um, uh, a, a huge battery pack. And uh, with this uh, battery of uh, five megawatt hour, they can do, they can do uh, zero emission when they are in port. Uh, so while we are waiting this uh, cold ironing and uh, the development of the facility for the electricity, uh, we have uh, these uh, large batteries uh, that um, are charged at the sea, so still with the fossil fuel, but uh, with a much lower uh, specific fuel consumption because it is through the main engine, which is large instead of a small auxiliary engine. And they take also advantage of some uh, energy efficiency technology like these uh, air lubrication that, that are bubbles under the hull. So in a way, the energy is, is recovered in various systems uh, with also solar panels and um, stored in the battery. And when the ship is at the berth, we can uh, you stay without uh, emissions at least for the eight hours of loading and loading. Because we operate this uh, Roro vessel and Ropax vessel. So basically, it is uh, on the motorways of the sea. And um, yeah, so ba back to the question. Uh, what I would like to see to say is that uh, where we need more innovation, I think uh, on uh, energy efficiency. On, on efficiency because uh, the first uh, renewable energy is the energy that you don't use at all. So if uh, we can manage to reduce the demand of energy, this is uh, for sure a, a target that uh, we make, a, we score a goal without uh, Everything can be done, but it's very complicated. So we already have uh, 90,000 ships out there. And uh, if uh, we manage to use them in a more efficient way, probably we can save 10-20% of the world CO2. We have uh, an emission as a shipping sector close to 1 billion tons of CO2. 
and the probably 10 20 percent is waste just because of the there is no just in time arrival in the ports or, or every single ship is not optimized uh, something else that we noted and i'm sure that the shipping will note more and more with the, the new index like uh, the carbon intensity indicator if you work uh, cleaning the hull like uh, normal cleaning uh, but uh, more frequent than a normal uh, uh, dry dock period, which can be three years, five years, so you can probably save a percentage of of, um, of fuel and the emission, which are quite important. So while uh, we um, are waiting, because from the industry side, the ship owner side, we need that the technology develop first. We need that the engine maker produce the main engine that can be fueled with ammonia or with hydrogen. This is not yet ready. But in the meantime, there is a lot that can be done still on the energy efficiency side, not using the energy. Thank you. So, from the port's perspective, I suppose, uh, uh, Ms. Rickbots, uh, your take on this? Uh... Yes, um, yeah, I'm the only port representative, so I will take this one. Uh, no, thank you also for the invitation and uh, and to, to be here at these 20 years. I think it's a fantastic event and it's good also to bring all stakeholders together in, at this event uh, because it's challenging times. And, and then I think if we talk about innovation, um, you talk innovate is is uh, make a reality better, huh? make the future better. But what we now see is the, the the reality is changing. I mean, your your parameters are changing the whole time. I mean, we had to fit for fifty five, or we have to fit for fifty five. We have repower now. I mean, so it's it, and this is the, the the more challenging bit because I think if I would say in a, we saw all the 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 words uh, with the Slido. I think of course we uh, if we think what should be innovate, it's new fuels, new energies, but it's also and I agree also with, with Dario, it's also uh, do more with less because certainly in the in the current environment where we we are facing uh, uh, energy shortages uh, maybe because we it's not only about shipping it's about the whole economy so we we will need to be more efficient and but also if we talk about greening we will also need to be more efficient with space because all the green energies uh, will need uh, renewables uh, to, to, to correspond to the, the supply and the demand. You will need a lot more storage capacities in ports, but you need space for that. And this is not so, so easy because ports in Europe are most of the time urban ports. Uh, so having receiving the space to, 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 to realize that this is not only something for the ports, this is also something for the shipping side. And there I would also agree with uh, uh, Minister Farucha, who says like it's not uh, shipping is not only about shipping, it's also about what is happening in the ports. And we need there the, the support of the shipping in our plea for 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 um, developing these areas, um, um, progressing in the investments in the ports and so on. It's not ports, you do your thing and shipping, you do your thing. I think there will be a, a need for a, a lot of cooperation, a lot of um, cross-sector cooperation, very new partnerships have to be built. Ports have to get uh, very knowledgeable in all energy uh, debates and we all have with energy stakeholders you will need skills and i think also on the ship side it's not anymore about it is about logistics but it comes on top the whole energy debate and and so this is a, a, a whole new uh, way of thinking and i would say if we talk about innovation it's just not about innovative technologies no it's innovative thinking innovative partnerships uh, also innovative way of making legislation because it's in a, a world that is moving the whole time, uh, both uh, in terms of technology, in terms of realities and so on. It's very, and I do not envy policymakers on that, but it's very difficult to, to prescribe rules um, because maybe, you know, you do... All these investments are very heavy investments, long-term investments, and if, you, if there is a rule and then the reality changes uh, overnight, 
you you very quickly are there with stranded assets and maybe be uh, lost money and lost public money in uh, many cases. So this, I think, that this innovative way of thinking, innovative cooperation, um, cross sector is as important as the technology itself. Um, so I would leave. Thank you. Thank you very much. So coming to the, you could say, the producers of uh, all this innovative technology, uh, Christoph Tutgat uh, from Sea Europe, uh, the manufacturers and shipyards perspective. Thank you. And first of all, I would like to um, congratulate also on my behalf um, EMSA for the uh, 20th anniversary. Um, it reminds me that we are all getting older because I still remember the, the birth of it. Um, and also thank you for the invitation. Now, to come to your question, when you ask a, a broad question on a broad term like innovation, you get a broad um, uh, input. Uh, and I think you can basically boil it down to, from what I've seen, the greening or the decarbonization, the digitalization and automation, and to an extent also the working conditions. Perhaps one thing that was missing, where I think there is still room for a lot of improvement and a lot of innovation is the ship production. Um, it always um, surprises me to see that in Europe we make very complex ships, but that actually the production process is not always as innovative as the product that is made. And I think there is certainly um, room for uh, improvement there, for innovation there, uh, because it also, of course, uh, relates to the competitiveness that, that we have. Having said this, um, I'm very proud that, that my members actually drive the innovation with new technologies, with the integration of um, new technologies, because they have to, on the basis of political uh, demands, they have to because of uh, customer demands, and they have to because the uh, situation sometimes uh, asks for it. Um, when it comes to, to EMSA, because there, of course, the safety element uh, is, is related to it, I think th there is certainly with the digitalization and the uh, automation and autonomy, a lot that can still be done. And where, of course, the maritime safety um, will certainly play an important role. And I think uh, in future, your task will not diminish quite on the contrary, I, I think. But if I may just uh, make two observations, which are a bit broader than just innovation. I've heard a lot about um, we being a conservative industry. If you see the innovations that we produce, I think we have to be a bit careful by considering us as conservative. Perhaps sometimes the thinking is conservative, but the products we make are very innovative. That's uh, one observation. The other observation is that we talked a lot about competitiveness, absolutely right. But competitive nowadays is not just an economic consideration. It also becomes more and more a geopolitical consideration. And there, uh, the link with strategic autonomy should not be overlooked. And if I speak uh, on behalf of the shipyards for a moment, we need to ask ourselves the question in Europe, is it sustainable? Is it, um, are we resilient enough if um, most of the ships, including the green ships that we are debating today, are actually ordered in Asia? I'm not going to answer the question. I think from my perspective, you know the answer, but I think we all need at national level and at European level to ask ourselves the question, is that sustainable and are we resilient enough? We talk about Russia and our energy dependence. I think we also need to consider whether the products that we have operating in our uh, waters, whether we should not do more to bring them back, at least in part, to, uh, to Europe. And then last but not least, if we want to be and remain ahead of innovation, if we want to, let's say, pinpoint where we need the innovation, we need to be targeted. And target means also sectoral policy, not just horizontal policy. And I think that also there, there is certainly room for the EU to reconsider its dogma of horizontal policies, the kind of one size fits all, applying to each and uh, every individual economic sector, regardless of the needs, regardless of the specific challenges, we need to have more targeted and sectoral policies. That's how our competitors in Asia do it, and that's why they are successful. And I think that we also need to do in Europe. Thank you. So you have already now started also on sort of the issue as how do we pave the way. We will come back to that in just a, a few minutes. Linda, coming to you in a, 
you could say practical implementation perspective because that's very much what IMSA is doing and you're also pushing the limit and making new things doable. So what's your take on this? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to congratulate myself, but I want to <laughs> congratulate at least the team that has organized uh, this fantastic two-day event because uh, I'm very much impressed what my colleagues have achieved uh, in those two days. Uh, okay, now I close the, the parenthesis and I, I'm going to the into innovation. I, I think from the government side, um, we need to see how to embrace innovation. There is a technology push. We have set policy objectives, but how to embrace and how to orchestrate innovation. And I think there uh, we still have a big challenge. And this is not an easy task. It's not about being a good or bad government. I think it is very challenging how to regulate, not only to regulate in the, in the wider sense of the word. So if you look at innovation, there's immediately the question of standards. If we want to use innovative equipment, uh, we need to have an international recognized standard. So we need to, to look at standardization. We need to look also at the legal framework, uh, because if the legal framework is not there, and, and there we are always lacking a bit behind. So we are also always running behind the industry. There is a kind of, a kind of autonomous uh, technology push from the industry. Um, and then we need to somehow accommodate that and to start to regulate it. And that's quite, quite difficult. Um, these tasks are not always done in a holistic manner where we lose the sight on the, on the operations. So what indeed is, is the, the impact on the implementation? And I think that our colleague from the port uh, said some very valuable things. I think we have to look at the overall chain and what is the effect of, of the innovation th that it will bring. And I will give you one example. We talk a lot about uh, decarbonization and alternative fuels. And of course, from EMSA, we try to accommodate and looking at the safety aspects of the alternative fuels, which also need to be standardized and we have to mitigate the, the new safety risks coming from the alternative fuels. But that's one side. That's again, uh, um, somehow a, a, a limited technical um, consideration. But now if you look at the bigger picture, um, for example, the port of Antwerp uh, specializes in hydrogen. But in Japan, they focus on ammonia. So if you are a ship owner, what are you going to do? Uh, are you going then to invest in ammonia? Are you going to invest in hydrogen? Uh, uh, what will be about the fuel supply? Are the ports able to, to uh, um, have the supplies needed for your vessel? So I, I'm afraid that if the governments do not start the dialogue and start to orchestrate, we are going to have a beauty contest between alternative fuels. And that I think is not helpful because that will confuse the industry, that will confuse sports. So there, um, and it is not easy to how to tackle that. But I think in, in the bigger dialogue between also uh, um, the ports, the, the shipping side, the, and also the governmental side, uh, we should also have that discussion. Because otherwise, we end up in, again, uh, this beauty contest between different uh, alternative fuels that will not help us. And then innovation becomes, again, a complicating uh, factor, which not help to achieve the policy goals that have been set for, for the Green Deal and fit for, for 55. So I think that's also an aspect that somehow this kind of uh, orchestrating or, or strategic approach, uh, we are not always uh, reached that stage anymore. We are so much, uh, let's say, um, taken up with the legal aspects, with the technical standardization aspects, that we, we miss a bit the, the oversight on what it really means in, in reality. And, and I think also, that, that's, sorry to be a bit long, but uh, that was a, th a bit my thoughts after hearing the ports uh, also uh, talking about the chain that we have to look after and how it will work in reality. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, you know, based on all the inputs that you have given here, there's no doubt everybody says, yes, we need innovation there, and especially decarbonization, ship side, port side, uh, equipment side, the equipment manufacturers say we're already doing a lot, but they also signals, and I think that the industry also say that on some, or you could say there are a number of players who are very slow in adapting innovation. So the question is, if we need innovation on, and based on what you're saying is, yes, we do need, because we do need to bring the industry forward. But it's, it's very competitive. Everybody talks about level playing, field, so my question is, how do we then pave the way for this innovation for development of the industry? Is it going to be regulation? Is it going to be market driven? So the manufacturers say, wow, here we have a component, please buy it. And everybody says, yes, we're going to buy it. Or what, what is going to drive it? How do we pave the way? And again, uh, 
we will end up, I think, just asking you, Linda, also in the end. So what can EMSA do to pave the way? But I will leave it open if anybody wants to take there to take a shot at this. Uh, so how do we pave the way? Please, it's better. Um, thank you for referring, but uh, I mean, yeah, how do you do it? And, and you said maybe governments have to orchestrate, and I would say yes and no, because it's true you will have hydrogen, you will have ammonia and so on, but you can't, there is not one port, there is not one, one shipping segment. I mean, there are different shipping segments, different ports. Um, and, and we know it for shipping. I, I talked to the to, to, to cruise and, and the ferry sector, and they said ammonia, no, the, 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 who have people on board, uh, the ships, the passenger ships. They say, oh, no, ammonia, I, I don't see it for, for our sector. And some said. So, I mean, th then you have ports, hydrogen, ammonia, again, in very urban ports, there is the safety aspect, you will have to tackle that. So, I mean, these are all differences that you have to see, and, and we are not yet there to see what are the safety aspects, what are the, the safety parameter you need, uh, if you want to bunker and so on. Uh, so this, all these things have to, so to orchestrate now and say you all do this or you all do that, I think that is maybe not the way to go. But I think there is really a role for the government uh, or governments, let's say, in, in clear goal setting, in uh, clearly um, creating uh, an enabling environment. And I think there are, for instance, some good in the Repower Europe, some good initiatives that are, you know, de developing these go-to areas where, where that they now introduce, where you would have in these areas easier yeah. permitting. But if I may, as well, it sounds really, I, I think it sounds as a fantastic idea, you know, an enabling environment. Yeah. But what is that? Yeah, but uh, I'm just saying. Oh, sorry. That, no, no, but I know it's very, <laughs> but I think you have to, uh, an, an, an environment that, that creates the dialogue. I think cooperation, we, everyone have to, has to talk. And, and it looks like very complex because if you talk, we, you don't find a solution. But I think if ports and their customers talk, if, for instance, we have these green corridor concepts that are being developed, I think these are good. It's a mixture in a way of a, a, a bottom up and top down so but it's not so prescriptive and permitting i think it's a very important thing permitting uh, uh, for ports because this is something that that creates a lot of delays in the member states for new investments we all know for instance the port of rotterdam is on top of things yeah. but they are being blocked by 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 uh, by inconsistency by nitrogen uh, debate which blocks all the investments at the moment in, in in greening i mean these are i think this permitting easing that is already a, a very good thing that governments can do and goal setting okay thank you Christo? It's, I think we are living again a chicken and egg discussion. Um, is it market who is going to dictate or should it be the regulator? I traditionally am not so much in front of regulators uh, pushing for something. Uh, I think we have a number of experiences where that has not always been a good thing. There are, of course, uh, good experiences too. Cooperation has been mentioned a couple of times. I think the complexity of the decarbonization is such that you can only succeed when you bring all the parties around the table. I mean, I've worked for some time in another segment of the shipping uh, world, the ship owners. If you see each segment has its own um, vision, struggles, obstacles, needs, challenges. From our side, it's actually not different. Uh, clearly, our equipment manufacturers, they can do it. Uh, but if I look at the shipyards, also they are, because of their customer, the ship owner, they are struggling. Will it be ammonia? Will it be biofuel? Will it be this? Will it be that? In my opinion, the only way we can do this is, and I'm repeating myself all the time, uh, until we will get there, we are really in need of a kind of, call it round table, where we are all sitting together, and where we kind of map the challenges and the needs and in my opinion, the regulation should now support uh, developments and provide stability also for the first movers.
because why should you move as a first if you're not certain that your investments that today look very promising and innovative may perhaps the day after tomorrow look already old-fashioned. So we will then continue to look at each other. I think we have to do this hand in hand and cross the, uh, the Rubicon like uh, Caesar did yeah. at the time. I think that's the only way. Um, and uh, if I may compare with our colleagues from other modes of transport, they have so, such firms. So I think we, we, okay, we have the ESSF, but I think we, on this one, we need something very specific, sitting all together and then go from there. Okay, but just uh, do I hear you say that uh, speaking from your side, you said before that you are doing a lot of innovation and, and of course, I mean, that's part of the raison d'etre for manufacturers that they need to develop their products. But you see regulation also as a barrier that... Uh, regulation can be a barrier and can be a facilitator. But if you look at alternative fuels, at this point in time, I think nobody dares to bet money on what will be the alternative fuel. It will be an evolution. And uh, again, what uh, looks the most promising today may tomorrow be something different. In that respect, I think that regulation could become more a stumbling block than a facilitator, I think. Thank you. So, Dario, coming to you, uh, and we will take the political perspective rounding off this, this uh, Dario, industry, Primaldi perspective. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I think that uh, regulation is... Uh, important and we soon will see the effect on that on the decarbonization because uh, ETS and uh, the other things that are coming will bring a, a strong incentive let's say to, to, to reduce emission because there is a high cost now for the CO2 emissions so um, but um, let me say that um, what we are uh, seeing today because we are here uh, European mainly, so let me say that uh, this uh, decarbonization target is not something that can be done uh, during one night. So ships that we have today or ships that are under construction today probably will be delivered uh, in 2025. They need uh, to live at least uh, 20 years. So they will be still around uh, in 2030, in 2040. So and uh, it's not uh, so quick like uh, with a car uh, to, to change a ship. So it is a, a, a long process. Not uh, all the ships uh, need the same things. So this um, technological neutrality, at least in the beginning, is quite important because a ferry needs something that for a container vessel maybe is different. What we can achieve uh, with the Ropax on 500 miles uh, cannot be probably achieved or can be achieved with the ferry. So electric uh, navigation is nice, but uh, we cannot manage for 400 miles to do the full electric. Otherwise, instead of the trucks, I should carry the batteries. But this is something that sometimes um, is not appreciated. Uh, when we have uh, applied for this uh, Roro hybrid in, uh, under the Innovation Fund, this was it was not eligible in a way because the hybrid content needs to be more than 50 percent but um, i cannot while the state of the art eventually it was five or six megawatt hour which is already a lot but was not enough for the criteria so i think that uh, uh, and then also under the um, innovation found a small and large scale that we have now on the table probably 1.5 billion euro for 2022 shipping is part of it maybe the little sister, but uh, there is not any, for uh, intra-European shipping, there is no direct access to the fund. So probably something we could think is that uh, there are the motorways of the sea, but also the motorways of the sea mainly provide uh, incentive to the ports, but not to the ships. So. I think that uh, intra-European shipping uh, should need uh, to be a, a bit more uh, help when it comes uh, to, the, to, the, to this um, innovation because uh, we, we can do a lot, but uh, as he was saying, uh, we need also to reward or to help the first movers uh, in these fields. So you would like to see the political framework sort of setting up financial incentives, uh, making it paving the way in, in economic terms? 
Yeah, uh, yes, as I said, the, um, what is coming now, for example, with the year we are where uh, uh, TATIS was, uh, was uh, started and we know how much the intra-European shipping emit under the MRV and soon we will have the ETS. So we know the importance and the, the contribution also for, from intra-European shipping and this can, uh, can, uh, can be looked in the, in the perspective of, of we want to be the first in class. We are uh, the ones where the, all the technology, the new technology will be implemented. So this is something that we can do together. Thank you. So turning to the political. Uh... Yes, uh, uh, as, a, as a politician and as a minister of transport, I, I frequently participate in such panel debates on of different transport sectors and I hear actually the same discussions everywhere <laughs> both in, uh, it uh, it's in a car industry it's a, uh, especially heavy truck uh, industry where there is no clear answer what technology and what solution will will uh, be the best one in the railway sector the same we are still discussing hydrogen electricity other other solutions uh, and and uh, in the maritime industry is the same so um, I, I think for politicians uh, it uh, would be very uh, wrong to, to look for one miracle, for one uh, specific solution and then promote only one, one direction. It's, it's the industry that has to find uh, the right uh, approach. The, the political and society, we uh, can uh, set the framework, we can set the targets, where we are going uh, to go, what, what we would like to achieve uh, in respect of the uh, decarbonization, for example, well, uh, energy independency, uh, where, uh, what are our targets, uh, best wishes, and then um, uh, that is the industry which uh, provides solutions. We can, from the political and from the government point of view, we can provide funding for, for research as a horizon um, funds and, and different other EU, EU funding. Uh, instruments, uh, uh, lending instruments that that are helpful for innovation, uh, but uh, I would be very hesitant to, to uh, say which particular solution is the best for for one particular um, part of the industry. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the same wavelength with Minister Linkheits in that in the sense that. You know, we should not romanticize the discussion, not just here, but also at council level, at commission level, and, and all that. I, I would prefer to be more clinical, because as I've said, the industry needs stability. And as the minister rightly said, there is no one says fits all, one solution to everything, especially when it comes to the fuel issue. I mean, I've been reading and hearing about what could be the solution, but there's no solution right now. So let's be more clinical. Um, let's not romanticize the, the discussion. And I would, I would prefer to strike the right balance between what is desirable. And the desirable can be a desktop research, a discussion between policy advisors in a, in a room. But when you go down with the industry and meet them in the shipyards, meet them in their offices, you do understand what is doable. And as a politician, I think what we need is a balance between what is desirable and what is doable just to have the stability that the industry needs. Secondly, it's between being sustainable and being competitive. I mean, it's, it's nice to say we have to be the best, um, Europe should lead the way forward, and we should. But then we should be very careful not to lose competitiveness. Because what we might do, be doing is just pushing the industry out of the European Union after you know the pandemic after the war and so i would prefer to find the right balance between yes leading the discussions on being more sustainable but being very careful on having that competitive edge which brings the industry back home i i, I think many people would endorse what you're saying but if i if i may i mean is it just ask you you know that are we not in a situation, I mean, both on decarbonization, but also on other areas where we could use more innovation, more development, uh, where what is doable is what we're already doing, but we need to make new things doable. So it's like a chicken and egg situation. And then, so I'm just asking your perspective, 
would there not be, I mean, regulation has been a strong driver for innovation in the maritime industry. So what's different now? I mean, in just because we're talking decarbonization, and is there, a, I, I understand there's a balance to strike, but if nobody's demanding anything, then what is doable will just remain doable and we're not finding new things to make doable. No, I, I don't agree with you on that on that point. I'm not saying that it's, this is an issue of a chicken and deck situation. What I'm saying is that if we are going to change, and we should, we are agreeing here that we should change, it should be on international level, at IMO level, not at just at European Union level. Because at EU level only, we will be just pushing the industry out to other countries, mm. outside the Union, outside the bloc. But that's a level playing field, you're wrong. The f on a that's right, scale. exactly. exactly. Yeah. So what, what I'm after is this. Yes, we should innovate. Yes, we should look forward to, to, to change. But this should be done at an international at level. Global scale. Exactly. Okay. So, Linda, as I promised, in an IMSA perspective, taking stock of all these, you know, there's a strong interest in innovation, but there's also, you know, level playing field, uh, paving the way, making it easier. Uh, so what can IMSA do on this? You have been here from the very beginning, <coughs> and you have, I mean, you have spearheaded the latest lead, the and, now it's going, and other things, so. And now it's being used against. So come with all the practical solutions now, Linda. <laughs> No, of course, the, the EMSA perspective is, is, is very, uh, let's say, specific because uh, we will look very much at the uh, safety aspects of the, of, the new, of the new fuels and also to look at the, um, uh, let's say, uh, how, how it can be used in a safe way, what are the, the risks, how to mitigate the risk of using those new fuel, uh, fuels, which is partly also guidance for the industry. Um, but as I already said, we should not be prescriptive. There is no, uh, let's say, winner uh, amongst the alternative fuels. But I think still it is good <coughs> to have this, this this dialogue with with all the stakeholders uh, uh, to see uh, what are the constraints on different sides. Uh, we can deliver as EMSA the constraints from a kind of safety perspective. So uh, when we study the different alternative fuels, uh, we can say what are the, the risks involved in using uh, those fuels. So also from a governmental responsibility, you can say, okay, uh, we would prefer this and this and that, and we can make maybe a top three or some, something. Uh, from the ports, they also need to say what is feasible uh, in the sense of, of, of also fuel supply, but also storage, uh, how to bunker those ships uh, with those fuels. And, and I can imagine that not every port can offer ammonia and hydrogen and methanol and biofuels, et cetera, et cetera. So at certain moment, you, you need to, to come to a, um, a limited number of the most feasible and most attractive fuels that can be used, because otherwise it starts to become an obstacle also for decarbonization. Because if everybody is investing in something different, then we have a lot of lost investment, because you are, may lose uh, investing in the wrong technology or in the wrong fuel type. Um, and on the other hand, uh, that will also start to confuse uh, and hinder the, the industry that wants to move now quickly with the policy goals that have been set uh, to decarbonization, and we all want to reach the, those, those goals. So, I, but that's more, let's say, in the, in, the, in the area of soft law. It is not about being prescriptive, legislative, uh, saying what has to be the, the one, uh, but also to understand. And I think we are still very much uh, working in our shipping silo, uh, working very much in our port silo, uh, maybe also the, the fuels and the energy has, has its own silo. And I think certainly for, for, for this discussion, it's very good to bring around the table uh, the different parties and let them explain what are the constraints and the possibilities that they see uh, for their domain. And in the past, we had uh, wise men panels, so maybe in the future we can have wise women panels that start to, to further look into this uh, issue uh, and, and really uh, do something. And whether EMSA should play a role in that, uh, that I don't know. Uh, we could, uh, if we're being asked. We will certainly do the technical analysis from our side. And I think that helps to have a kind of neutral view because it is not about uh, uh, favoring one technology over the other. I think we need to have an objective assessment uh, what are the pros and cons of every alternative fuel that uh, we want to use to reach the decarbonization uh, goals. Thank you. So, um, dipping a little bit uh, deeper into innovation in a specific sector, and that's the digitalization, which uh, I remember going back, uh, before we really started to talk about greenhouse gas and the green transition, everybody spoke about digitalization. We're going to have a hockey stick moment. It was going to change the world, disrupt everything. But then now looking, <laughs> looking back now, yes, there has been a lot of digitalization, I would claim, on the commercial systems. 
Uh, but if you look at the ship operation systems, uh, I would say that we have maybe not in the maritime sector been very strong in adapting and maybe not so strong in using digitalization as a disruptor. So I will ask the panel here, where are we in digitalization? Is digitalization going to be a game changer for the maritime sector? Does it have potential to improve safety, security, greening? And what can we do to pave the way? Rosa, I can see you are nodding. Uh, would you yeah. kick off on this one? I think we all agree that the, the discussions we have every day uh, evolve around two, two topics, decarbonization and digitalization in each and every meeting, council level, at government level. So um, what, what I've noticed is that um, um, that's the sentence which, which came up with uh, Miss Isabel uh, Ricost um, in, in, in her previous intervention, do more with less. And this applies to many topics. She mentioned the fuel shortage, but I would say also the staff shortage. I know that Cyprus has this problem. The Greek minister was saying yesterday that he has this problem. We have it back home. So um, we know that we have this problem now and we're going to face it in the next few years. So I think doing more with less is the way forward, especially when it comes to digitalization. I think we can use this um, uh, to compensate for the lack of stuff we're having um, in this industry itself. So, you know, optimizing um, the industry itself, um, the capacities of shipping, smart shipping. So when it comes to the um, productivity, the organizational and the compliance. So the three of them can move in this direction. I've, uh, and, and I've asked the industry itself about, about what they are doing. And they've mentioned the use of electronic certificates nowadays that is being used to reduce bureaucracy, facilitate port uh, state control, and address cybersecurity issues. I mean, run of the mill, of course, but these are um, things which are happening right now. I've met, they've mentioned also other shipping documents, such as the bunker delivery notes, again, being efficient, increase security, and mitigate potential tampering. So I think, you know, the blockchain world of out there should be applied in this sector too. Um, of course, because innovation without digitalization will not happen and vice versa. So definitely they go together and I think we should be pushing forward digitalization as much as we're doing with, with the other topic. Minister Linkert, sir. Yes, of course, digitalization is, is one of the uh, aspects of, of increasing competitiveness of the industry. And, uh, and also, as, as my colleague rightly mentioned, uh, the, the shortage of the staff is, is increasing. And we see the uh, aging of population in Europe uh, and, uh, and similar aspects and attractiveness of the sector. Therefore, we, we uh, should look at different systems, how, how they operate more efficiently. Uh, for example, in, in aviation, uh, it's almost like a competition between airlines uh, who who will introduce something paperless uh, in, in, in their work. Uh, um, I am not an expert in, in maritime uh, industry, how it is in a, in a shipping side, but I know that in port uh, facilities, there, the, the, there is a huge, huge advantage. Uh, and, and, and in recent years, the digitalization of different processes has, has become a, a crucial trend. And uh, since I'm also Minister of Communications, uh, I, I see also the, the, the telecommunication industry advancing very rapidly in uh, providing these uh, uh, tools, technologies, 5G network. This is the next step uh, that will allow businesses to, to use uh, different automated uh, systems, uh, unmanned systems uh, in, in, in areas of ports, for example. Uh, but uh, as, as with uh, all the issues, there is a room for improvement, definitely. Okay. Any other takers, uh, Dario? Quickly, because so many things have been already said, but um, I think, yes, they go together also with uh, not only with the decarbonization, but also with these uh, autonomous ship. And we are in, in many projects where uh, of R&D where uh, we see the high potential, uh, not so much for the unmanned vessel for the long way, but uh, at least for the maneuvering import, the help that can be done uh, 
for safety aspect and also for a better berthing uh, through this system. One uh, thing that we noted from the Again, it is very important from the easy things like a voyage optimization of a ship up to the blockchain. So everything should be developed. And yes, uh, shipping is uh, is um, a bit behind compared with uh, uh, aviation and uh, rail. Uh, something that we noted as a new challenge that we were not expecting is the conflict with the cybersecurity. So every time uh, we want to, for example, transfer the data data from the ship uh, to shore, uh, for example, if we want to monitor some equipment uh, or we want to give all the information to the shore, uh, we have problem of cybersecurity because our people of the cyber come and say, ah, sorry, you cannot do this uh, protocol. So this is uh, something we, we are facing today that uh, uh, there are new challenges that uh, need to be uh, addressed for for the um, security, but then uh, in a way we will have to to continue, and uh, I'm sure that this will bring uh, a lot of advantage soon. No, Isabel, you want to? Hello. Yes, um, uh, I think in digi um, the digitalization is very important, uh, certainly as an instrument, uh, as a tool for, for uh, environmental performance. Um, uh, for efficiency is, is so important, for instance, in, in the whole asset management of a port, you can do a lot of savings by, by monitoring a lot of things. For instance, now they monitor, they can monitor, you know, they monitor the, the access to the ports, which kind of ships you have during a whole year and you can avoid having to dredge maybe 10 centimeters more because you see that in fact you, you do not need this depth. So this is a, a big rationalization, both environmental, money and so on. But it's also difficult, I mean it costs a lot of money and also as has been said um, it's becoming a, a very strong tool and, and ports are using it a lot. Uh, but it's a strong tool and, and let's say the enemy sees it as a strong tool as well. So, so cyber security becomes a, a big issue. We have seen it the last months that there has been quite some attempts to, to, to with cyber a, a attacks on ports. Uh, as far as I know, they have always been countered in a, in a good way, but, but it could be, it could be a, uh, it's a game changer and also not from the shipping from us from what we have to do in digitalization but I think the whole economy is being digitalized and this also uh, changes the whole logistic chain huh? we are all uh, we don't go to the shop anymore but we order online we we can trace it's also for um, uh, um, carbon uh, you know the the, the 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 client the customer will also become a lot more knowledgeable about emissions and so on they will be able to track in the future so all this knowledge it's also a push for the sector to 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 advance on on, on greening in a way so this you can also have uh, it's also an aspect of digitalization yeah okay i think uh, i think we will turn to the audience now uh, because the, the the last question we will address is is not to do with technology but more with the people uh, but but before we do that, if there are anybody in the audience who want to ask questions, are you out there? They are. Wow. Anyone? No. So we will continue. Christoph, you want to address on the digitalization? Are you? Do you have software developers also in C Europe, or is it all hardware? I think the two. <laughs> no, but I mean, I, I didn't want to repeat what was already said. Um, I think what we certainly see is that digitalization and automation is changing the game, and most likely it will become a full game changer. But there is certainly still a long way to go. Um, I think a common understanding of what we are talking about is certainly important. And we started with innovation. Even though there is already a lot of innovation, there is still a room for more, uh, more targeted, and um, well, perhaps paving the way to, towards it. 
we had um, we were successful on the decarbonization to get a co-program partnership on zero emission waterborne transport, which is let's say helping investments in research and development to decarbonize, and that's underpinned by a specific vision of the entire maritime sector in the context of the waterborne technology platform. I think there is certainly also room for digitalization and automation to do something likewise. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if we leave, try to leave the technology side, because when we say innovation and development, we very much think about new fuel types, uh, new kind of hardware, uh, digital solutions, uh, uh, and but we still, as I also said in my speech yesterday, it all boils down to people in the end. It's people who actually are doing the difference. Uh, so uh, my question is, is there a need or room for innovation also looking at the way that we operate ships? Uh, I hear people say often that if you look at the way ships are operated, it's very much based on the same model that was created in the back a thousand years ago. Uh, the only big change there was was in beginning of this century when we had the engine on board and all of a sudden there was an engine department that was really a big thing. Uh, but then it has very much been the same. So the question is, are there room for innovation here? Uh, or how can we, what should we do in terms of the people side? Please. Uh, but uh, we had discussions in, in Latvia in this respect, uh, uh, and it is about uh, the younger generation and, uh, and about uh, education system. Uh, we used to have also maritime schools and, and maritime academy with, with traditional way of uh, teaching uh, new stuff, uh, the, the operations. But uh, nowadays, ships are getting so modern, uh, so up-to-date and digitalized and, and uh, with new technologies that also the education system should follow and, and should, uh, uh, should provide uh, additional knowledge in, on IT issues, on, on mathematics and, and things like that. Uh, so it's not uh, any more um, pure mechanical uh, work, it's, it's more with the brain. And here uh, it's again, uh, on one side it's a challenge to, to, to tell our younger generation and our, our maritime society that you have to change, you have to uh, get additional knowledge, but it's also an advantage uh, for younger generation who are very much interested in, in such type of, uh, of uh, jobs that, uh, that uh, maritime industry and maritime uh, profession is getting uh, uh, attractive again. We could look from this perspective. Yeah. yeah. I've be, I became minister circa 100, 100 days ago, and my, my, my first two weeks were just meeting the industry itself. And my first question, being an economist by, by training, not, not, not in, the, in the industry itself, was what makes Malta successful in this industry, given that shipping is one of our main pillars, economic pillars. And the industry were telling me, meeting after meeting, that it was about the workforce, the specialized workforce we offer to the to the industry itself, so being the, the technical and a robust legal uh, process. So the legal part of it too. So being solution-based and cost-effective were key to Malta becoming what it is today in this industry itself. So I think definitely innovation, digitalization are key for us, but also investing in our people. And this is a, a, a huge headache apparently, not just for Malta, but also for other countries, including Latvia, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing right now, Cyprus, Greece, and, and all other countries. So I think possibly we can explore with EMSA um, how we can discuss this topic um, at a higher level. Because if this is a huge challenge for us, country after country, member state after member state, possibly we can discuss it at a higher level. And um, definitely, the technical, the legal, the operational are going to be key to, to consolidate what we have right now. I, I mean, discuss further future demand, future development of, uh, of the workforce. Or yes, yeah. a specialized workforce. I mean, in Malta we have IMLI. Um, uh, we, train, we train the legal brains of the world out there. 
Um, I know that there is, uh, I've discovered just yesterday that there is also the World Maritime University in Malmo, um, which I, I didn't know about. But we're training the legal brains, but what about the others, the seafarers out there? And I think we should focus on that in the coming weeks and months. Thank you. Dario Bocchetto, uh, Bocchetto it, it, w w what's your take on this? I mean, do you do you need, uh, are you running things that they have been running for a hundred years or are you going new ways in, in Grimaldi? We have on board about uh, 15,000 uh, crew from all around the world. And uh, yes, in general, we see that while the technology goes uh, up with a lot of things, uh, the batteries and technology on board, on the other side, the, the competence, the skill are slightly getting down in the last very broadly average in the last 20 years. So yes, there is a, a problem on that. And, uh, um, and it is, uh, you know, and we need uh, to to push much more on the on the training and on the skill of the people that go on board. Uh, I would not exaggerate to say that uh, uh, we need uh, to change totally the way of sailing. I think that uh, this is also I don't want to say romantic, but uh, there is the the way to take the sea is that one since. Uh, hundred of years and we don't need necessarily to change because at the end of the day people are the ones that stay on board and once they are 100 miles from the coast they are alone and they will always be alone even if uh, we make a very nice satellite connection so they really mm, they are the people that stay there and uh, as for what I see uh, staying on board the vessels uh, their uh, experience basically is uh, just the sum of the mistake that they have done during the years of their life. So they also need this. Uh, in general, on board the ship, um, the more skilled people are the ones that uh, have been there for a long time and they have always done the thing in that way. So you cannot completely change that thing. You also want that uh, they make their experience and uh, they needed to to live with the same thing for a certain period of time you cannot change everything every day because it's not a, it's not a, a robot even though on the other side the autonomous vessel and these things can be developed and can be very good in some in some traffic so to make it short yes investing more in 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 the training and also in in building a, a, a community that already exists but could be broader uh, in terms of uh, interest and uh, also love to this type of job. Yes, sir. I think your question is a very interesting one. Do we need innovation on the side of the workforce? Certainly, yes. Also from our side as, as industry. Um, we have an aging population. It will have to be replaced. Uh, leave alone all the evolutions that we know are coming uh, with digitalization and automation. And um, we talked already about it yesterday and, and it was also touched upon uh, today. Um, before you can uh, train or retrain people, you need people. And we have a problem of attractiveness, not just on the ship shipping side, but also on our side as industry. Um, there is also competition for skills. So you can have people, you can train them, and then uh, by the time that they are trained, they are gone to other industries because of nicer uh, salaries, nicer co working conditions, and so on. But it's certainly going to be a very important challenge that uh, we uh, will face also on the industrial side. Finding the people, um, training them, having the right education, and that I think also in many countries uh, requires the regaining the attractiveness of technical education, which too often, if I take my own country, Belgium, where technical education is a bit seen as, uh, well, if you don't know anything else, or you don't, uh, you're not able to do anything else, then you go for technical education. I think this is a mindset that we certainly have to, to, to change. And then, of course, we will need to, to yeah, increase the attractiveness and uh, make sure that, that we maintain the people and that we can keep them up to speed um, with the pace of the digitalization and, and automation, uh, let's say, uh, evolution. But isn't there a 
I mean, it's strong connection between what people are trained for and what the owners, the, the industry wants them, how they want them to work. Uh, and is there a mismatch uh, or is, is there anything that should be done here? I'm asking because if you look at the SCCW convention that basically sets the legal framework for how seafarers should be trained, it mentions uh, celestial navigation. Uh, it doesn't mention cybersecurity. It does not mention the word leadership, uh, cooperation, social skills. And normally when I hear uh, both uh, industry, uh, ship side, shore side, also on the political level that we want a workforce that's much more capable. So I'm just asking, is there, well, well, what should we do here to pave the way for this innovation? Yeah. What should be done here? Please, Isabel. Um, I think that um, uh, both shipping uh, jobs in shipping and in ports have been a lot like family jobs. I mean, going from uh, uh, grandfather, the son, the, you know, it was like a tradition and, and you see it still with port workers as well. It's uh, very much the, 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 the port workers to, are not always the, the mirror of the population in the cities. And so uh, this tradition has been, has gone a bit, you know, there is not anymore the sun and the, the and this is one thing I think this, because it's a way of life. I think both on port side and shipping, it's a way of life and it's, a, 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 I would call it a microbe. If you, if you have this maritime microbe or port microbe, you, and so this is something that now has to be cultivated with, with in cities, with, with people who, who didn't have this tradition. And port cities, it's a lot about port cities because, I mean, now in many port cities, you don't see the ships anymore because the, the, the cities have been, become bigger and the port has been pushed a bit outside the city. So this physical distance is there and also the mental distance. And now I think I think all our ports are really making efforts for, for open door days, for, for doing things. And this should be enhanced also from the schools. You know, bring schools and bring children to the port because I think if you if children have to learn uh, what ships are, they have to come to the ports because they can, they will not see them at full sea or uh, not so much. So the port is where they can see what is happening, and there what what and this is probably a combined effort that is needed by all maritime and port stakeholders is to show what the port is today. I mean that you do not need to be this strong bloke with a lot of muscles who carries every day so much that it's really a technological thing that you. Also have a lot of jobs that you have in other areas of the city. You have them in the port as well, and this can bring and attract people to to this business. And then at the same time, I think then for the the ship side, I think a, a career in shipping is if if you can say you do it for for of course you cannot do it for two years, but you do not have to do it for your whole life being on sea. But you can afterwards also take a job at shore and be very useful in the ports or in the maritime businesses at shore. And this is also something that maybe needs more to, to be explained to, to make it attractive. Because that you're not signing a contract for, for 40 years at sea. Uh, that is maybe all things we, we more need to explain and make it attractive uh, for everyone. Kisov? If I, if I may, your question was also a bit, is there a mismatch between what we do and what the ship owners want and, and do? I think um, a reference was made to that yesterday by the Secretary General of EXA. We have this C project where I think now the owners, the, um, the, the, the representatives of crew, but also of industry, uh, my members, uh, are actively participating in order to kind of reduce the mismatch and 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 make the match uh, much better um but there are also other initiatives uh, on a, in a broader sense uh, the pact for skills and so on i think th th it's a positive evolution to see that the commission is taking more and more initiatives also on that side uh, i think it it, it uh, illustrates an awareness that um, there is a need and i think it's only but recommendable that that the industry is taking part in that and 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 try to to have a better match, then uh, there is still a lot of, 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 of improvement.
that is necessary, but I think there is already a good basis. Let's again turn to the audience, see if anybody have a question or comment on this uh, topic. Anyone? Yes, one in the back. Can we have a mic? Thank you. Um, when trying to attract young people into the industry, there's an awful lot of talk about autonomy. And I think possibly the talk of autonomy at times put people off going to sea and attracting them into the maritime industry. I think it's maybe a little bit of a mixed message. Um, I know when I talk to young people back home and try to attract them to go to sea, it's like I think Dario brought it up there. A lot of the ships that are being built today don't have autonomous uh, systems, but these ships will be around for maybe the next 30 years. So there's, there are options there to stay at sea and then, um, as you say, go into maritime safety directorate, port state control officers, pilots, and that. So um, I'd like to ask the uh, group here, um, what do you think is the best way to perhaps not, not send this mixed message between autonomy and um, just getting people to go to sea? Yeah, good question. So is there a, is it a mixed message to say, we're going autonomous so you can forget about a career at sea? Or is it a driver for, so any perspectives on this? It's a very relevant question. Please. If I may, um, from what I understood um, from recent meetings I had, there is lack of awareness about the industry itself at least back home. So um, we are promoting other industries, being aviation, if we talk about transport, but we're not promoting maritime anymore. I mean, maritime was very, very, very important back home uh, years ago. People are still working there, but as my colleagues rightly said, we have an aging population, um, people are retiring, and we're not having enough people now to replace them. So I think the way forward would be, number one, having strong, a strong campaign, day in, day out, about the beauty of the, of, of the industry itself. Not just because it is a beautiful industry, um, but because it is rewarding too. There, there can be a career, you can have a good salary there, and a future for you and your family. Secondly, then comes the difficult part, training them. And that's where I think we're lacking. I think we're, we're, we're not organized on the message out there, what kind of training, um, perhaps we can do it at a, an international level. I mean, a few weeks ago, I visited a private company in Malta, which is now training people uh, in the private industry, and they, and they grouped and merged with a Greek company too. So something is happening, but not enough. And so it boils down to awareness. I think we should hammer down that the industry is here, it's going to be here in the next 50, 100 years, and that there is a rewarding career if you decide to train, to have the right training, and delve into it. Yeah, Minister Linkas, I can see you taking the mic already. Yes, I, I also don't see that there is a mismatch because the, the industry is so diverse. There is, there is so much uh, opportunities uh, and, and, uh, and uh, I, I would say there is a, such a wide range of professions that, that are needed in, in the maritime industry. So everyone can, can, can find its own, own suitable place. But, but I think that the question is, is larger and I fully agree with, with, uh, with uh, what was said that in in uh, modern society somehow technical professions are not anymore the sexy ones mm. and we have to work uh, all all of us uh, to, and uh, and also the the industry itself has to work very hard to to get back this this uh, feeling that this is something interesting that that is something uh, uh, rewarding uh, up to date uh, uh, that you can t uh, create uh, good careers there and and uh, you could be uh, well uh, um, uh, taken in society if you are in in this industry. 
So this is real our our task. Uh, uh, of course, uh, in maritime industry, you have to be open. You have to uh, tell also in in a modern language about ourselves, what what we are doing, how we are doing, what what are the opportunities. Uh, but but to get to the younger generation, it's more like like a, a perception. What what mm. kind of perception we create uh, from our industry? So so reflecting on the question from the from the gentleman who asked, uh, you think that maybe the autonomy should be part of our story, telling yes, how yes, definitely, how we are, definitely, yeah. it's one part. The, there could be interest also from younger generation to look at these. Uh, if if they play uh, computer games, they they can go for autonomous shipping uh, management as well. Yeah. Why not? How to sail a ship? Yeah, wow. Christoph, and then after that, Dario, and but uh, well, uh, joking apart, but I think you you touch upon a very interesting point. Awareness is certainly something we need to do, but it's not because you make your sector more, or you make people more aware of your sector that automatically becomes more attractive. Let's be honest: when people think of shipping, they think about uh, or they think of polluters, um, or in our case, um, we still call it the the three D: uh, difficult, dirty, dangerous. Uh, they see ships being beached somewhere in um, in a third country uh, in, 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 in very uh, awkward conditions. That's, uh, generally speaking, the image that, that people have of our sector. However, when you look at what we do, uh, when you look at the innovation we have um, in terms of greening, in terms of digitalization, if you look at some of the products we built in Europe, uh, and I'm not just talking about crews here, I'm, I'm talking also about other very sophisticated uh, ships that are actually also contributing to uh, reducing uh, the impact of shipping to the environment. I mean, those that are protesting in the street before COVID, they were very often thinking of shipping as the dirty and not as shipping contributing to a better environment. If we can turn that image into the, let's say, the narrative of the youngsters, we can contribute. And there is a lot that still needs to be done, but you can contribute by being part of that industry to a better environment. And you can uh, play with the joystick, not just on the computer game, but on, an, on a true vessel. It may uh, increase the attractiveness of, of our youngsters. We just need to increase the awareness, but also make it attractive along line, alongside the, 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 yeah, the thinking that youngsters have nowadays. Dario? Continuing on that, uh, uh, yes, I also, I think that um, in the recent years, uh, there was a lot from the European Commission promoting uh, shipping is, as uh, a much better way of transporting goods and people compared with other mode of transport in terms of uh, reduced impact on the environment. The story that uh, shipping goods with vessels uh, was a, had a much lower impact on greenhouse gas is something that today I don't hear so much from the side of the commission. I hear from our side of the industry, but uh, uh, it would be nice, yes, to continue that uh, together. And uh, about the question, uh, yes, I also don't see any problem of mismatching uh, with the uh, autonomous and, uh, and the growing, uh, uh, maybe the contrary, that uh, if uh, a, a young person knows that there is no satellite connection on the ship, he will not take the ship. So, because he cannot stay 24 hours without the mobile phone or anything. And then if you see the joystick now on the, the full navigation, that was 20 screen, one joystick now, like this. <laughs> so yeah, yes, there is, a, I would not know how to put my hands on that because I'm not good in video games, but I'm sure that they would be. And uh, so, I, uh, yes, they, they will be attracted by this challenge rather than uh, scared by that. And um, probably w what is a, a problem is the fact that uh, it's a challenging job because they have to stay on board the same thing and not free to go home for months. When uh, you are uh, on, uh, on uh, including for women and for men, so it's, not, it's, it's challenging the fact that you have to stay far from home uh, uh, for three months uh, or eventually much more. Mm, at the end of the day, I also don't stay so much at home because we travel, all of us, every day. But the fact that uh, you are uh, 
you realize it only after three months, but you don't know it in advance that you, you will not stay at home. So the fact that you are forced to stay home, and this probably is something that is improving somewhere, uh, can never become a ship, uh, even if even a ferry cannot become a, 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 a tram that uh, at night somewhere it's possible, but it's, it's very limited that you can uh, disembark every day and go home. Mm. This will not happen. But uh, on uh, on facilitating uh, this type of things, uh, probably uh, it will become more attractive. And, and on the other end, they yes, yes have to know what they are facing, but uh, also in a um, in a in a nicer or sexy way, as you say. Thank you. So, Linda, coming back to you, rounding off. Thank you. No, uh, I, I really see it as an opportunity uh, because automation uh, will not only lead to more redundancy and safer shipping, but indeed will lead to uh, a more uh, a high tech sector. And I think that's important to create that image that we see. We have to go away from the association of the rust and dirty smoke. And I think with, with the decarbonization and also with the automation, we, we are changing the, the sector slowly into a high tech sector. And that uh, as such, I think it will also be appealing to young people that with, with uh, really uh, sophisticated software and, and new applications, um, they will be attracted to, to work in that field. So I think it will really help for the, for the younger generation to become even more interesting in shipping. And there's a lot that can be seen. I mean, EMSA is a fantastic place to see how far we have come with IT solutions, many screens, joysticks, uh, etc. Yeah, And a great place to work. Yeah. And a great place to work. What a fantastic sentence to finish off with. With this, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you so much. So, Andrea, over to you. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, panelists. We come now to the end of our first part of the morning, so we will break up for half an hour uh, for a well-deserved coffee break up on the terrace, and we will gather back here at 10 for, sorry, 11.45 sharp.
Dear Maya and all EMSA staff, I have been working as a member of the administrative board for some years now and I have to say I'm very impressed of the high level of professionalism, diligence and quality of the agency's work. Now EMSA is celebrating its 20th anniversary and I want to wish you for myself and on behalf of the whole Finnish Maritime Cluster a very warm and happy birthday. I want to express my warmest congratulations to EMSA for completing 20 successful years. EMSA's impeccable work over the years has established it as a valuable asset to the European Commission in keeping the maritime sector safe, secure, green and sustainable through its valuable technical advice and guidance to the Commission. It has therefore been my pleasure to serve for the past five years in the EMSA Administrative Board, representing European ship owners and contributing to EMSA's efforts. The European shipping industry highly appreciates the work of EMSA. We look forward to EMSA's continuous close cooperation with the European shipping industry for an even brighter future for the European maritime sector and a competitively sustainable EU shipping. Happy anniversary, EMSA. Dear Maya and colleagues in EMSA, congratulations with your 20th anniversary. Coincidentally, we, the Paris MU, are celebrating our 40th anniversary this year. In the last decades of these 40 years, the collaboration with EMSA has started and continued to grow since then. The collaboration has brought a lot to the Paris MU. For example, EMSA manages the Paris MU database status. EMSA trains port state control officers together with the Paris MU secretariat. And EMSA is also closely involved in the Paris MU in other ways. EMSA's professional commitment is highly appreciated. Maya, I'm very much looking forward to further strengthening our cooperation in the years to come. Congratulations. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Malheureusement, je ne peux pas être à vos côtés, mais en tant que présidente de la Commission des Transports et du Tourisme au Parlement européen, je voulais vous dire merci et vous rappeler que l'Agence de Sécurité Maritime remplit à mes yeux une fonction absolument essentielle. En 20 ans d'existence, l'Agence a su accumuler un ensemble de connaissances et de savoir-faire qui sont devenus irremplaçables. Son rôle dans le secteur maritime est incontournable. Au cours des années que j'ai consacrées à ma commission, j'ai vu cette agence prendre de plus en plus d'importance et graduellement étendre son champ de compétences, bien que son financement n'ait toujours pas suivi et n'est surtout pas à la hauteur. Qu'à cela se tienne, l'agence a su faire face à ses nouvelles responsabilités et a continué à fournir des services d'une qualité irréprochable. Les membres de ma commission voient toujours nos échanges de vues annuels avec le directeur de l'agence comme un événement important de notre calendrier. Nos travaux de l'année prochaine comporteront une révision des régulations de base de l'agence tout en gardant nos priorités pour s'assurer d'avoir un secteur maritime européen qui soit durable, prenant à bras le corps la question de la transition énergétique et qui soit réellement compétitif. La vision de l'agence est celle d'un centre d'excellence au service d'un secteur maritime européen sûr, écologique et compétitive et les membres du Parlement européen, je vous le redis, sont là pour soutenir cette vision. Merci à tous d'être là au service de cette agence, de la porter, mais également pour vous dire à quel point nous en avons besoin. Bon anniversaire. Dear Administrative Board of EMSA, dear Management, dear Mrs. Markovčić Kostilac, heartfelt congratulations to the 20th birthday of EMSA on behalf of the European Maritime Pilot Association. EMSA and EMPA only differ in a small letter, but they do not differ at all in their objective of the improvement of safety and security in the maritime sector. We will stand by your side for the next 20 years and we wish you continued success in your work. Congratulations again and cheers. At Satsen, we have known EMSA for many years. I remember a first meeting between our two directors, at that time Frank Asbeck and Willem de Reuter. It was more than 15 years ago in Brussels where EMSA had its seat at that time. 
in the following, we work closely together with EMSA colleagues on common projects and established many personal ties. Today, we are partners in CISE, involving more than 300 EU and national authorities with responsibilities in maritime surveillance. And we collaborate also very much in Copernicus, the EU Earth Observation Programme. This increasingly closer cooperation is clearly a promising development for both agencies. A very happy birthday, EMSA. Greetings from the European Space Agency. I'm Simone Tacheli, I'm the Director of Earth Observation Programs at ESA, and also on behalf of our Director General Joseph Ashbacher, I'd like to send all the agencies greetings for this important day. Monitoring of ocean conditions for security and safety at sea are a high priority for all of us. At national and EU level, recognition of the importance of solving problems associated with maritime safety, prevention of pollution by ships and security on board ships has led the formation of EMSA as the responsible institution for the implementation of the legislation. This includes actions aimed at improving safety at sea for oil tankers and passenger ships, as well as bulk carriers, container ships and fishing vessels. EMSA has truly grown to this task, and ESA recognizes EMSA as the natural partner for the premier EU hub for maritime awareness picture and maritime security aspects. ESA has become a center of knowledge with EMSA. We've put resources together to make sure that uh, the benefit of Maritime Europe, an important facilitator of sharing EU products between key user communities. It has a unique role in accomplishing both preventing tasks and reactive tasks to improve maritime safety, to improve pollution uh, awareness, preparedness and response and maritime security. The European Space Agency is a key provider of Earth observation data and satellite information in support to EMSA activities. We do provide R&D and tools and we are very proud to work hand in hand with EMSA since many years to serve the maritime environment. Our cooperation agreement has been proved an effective framework for bilateral collaboration concerning the use of space-based system and data in support of EMSA operational maritime activities. The Copernicus satellites have been implemented by the European Space Agency and are providing reliable, efficient, timely and cost-effective information to respond to the needs for maritime safety and security. Copernicus satellites are delivering not only information which can mitigate shipping-related environmental risk, but also that can address relevant challenges linked to the sea and to the environment more in general. In particular, we have Sentinel-1 that can be seen as a workhorse for this important maritime security aspect of EMSA. The close collaboration between the two agencies over the past years has been extremely beneficial and has very, very been successfully contributing to delivering the best possible services to our stakeholders across Europe. On behalf of the European Space Agency, of all my colleagues of our Director General, I wish the European Maritime Safety Agency, EMSMA, all the best for the future and happy 20 years anniversary. On behalf of EXA, our members and our team, I would like to congratulate EMSA for the 20 years anniversary. Since its creation 20 years ago, EMSA has been a key partner for the shipping industry, providing knowledge, support and guidance to regulators and to ship owners. Over the over years, as you took on a growing list of tasks, your expertise, dedication has helped keep European seas safe, clean and secure. We're grateful for the close partnership we, we've had with the EMSA team over the years and we look forward to continuing and growing our cooperation. Congratulations, Maya. Congratulations, EMSA team and happy birthday to the European Maritime Safety Agency. Happy birthday, EMSA, from the whole CLIA team and keep on cruising. During the last 20 years, EMSA has been providing immense support and assistance to the Member States. The information systems managed by EMSA, such as the Safe CNET, Clean CNET, CETIS, European Maritime Single Window, Common Information Sharing Environment, and many others are systems that facilitate Member States in carrying out their tasks for ensuring safe maritime transport, as well as environmental protection. 
The cooperation with EMSA staff has always been pleasant and professional, and we trust that it will continue the same in the upcoming years. For the occasion of 20th anniversary, the Slovenian Maritime Administration extends its best wishes to the Executive Director Maya and the entire EMSA staff. Many years of success between Jordan and IMSA. Congratulations for the 20th anniversary of IMSA. On this 20th anniversary, we would like to warmly congratulate the European Maritime Safety Agency. Happy birthday, IMSA. Our congratulations to IMSA are not only for reaching this anniversary, but also for the excellent work during all those years for safety, security, and control and response to the pollution of our oceans. This is a task that IMSA and the S-Center have in common as two international organizations. both here in Lisbon and those watching us online. And now we come to a very important moment for us in EMSA, the launch of the European Maritime Safety Report, or as we call it, EMSAFE. Ladies and gentlemen, as you've all heard over the past two days, safety is the very heart of maritime transport and it's in the DNA of EMSA. For us, it's key to everything that we do. Maritime transport has a vital strategic and social role in Europe. It helps to ensure the free movement of goods and people within the EU, and it plays a key role in our economy. At the center of all this activity is maritime safety. The Erika and the Prestige accidents, devastating as they were, triggered a substantive reform in the existing EU safety regime. Today, the European Union has one of the most robust maritime safety systems in the world. In Europe, global standards are transposed into law by member states. The EU also contributes directly to the initiation and the development of standards at international level. And, in certain circumstances, it adds safety requirements for ships flagged to EU member states and operating to or from EU ports, irrespective of the flag. Safety is the basis for all shipping. From the moment a new vessel is planned, the preparation, design, construction and certification of a ship are all rooted in safety. But once the ship sets sail, safety challenges arise. The human element is at the heart of safe shipping. Here in the EU and internationally, well-trained seafarers are vital to ensuring maritime safety by reducing accidents. 
But the seafarer workforce is aging and fewer young people are choosing to join the maritime sector. High quality marine equipment supports the safe operation of a ship and saves lives if accidents occur. In the east, also a safety threat to the operation of modern ships. At international and at industry level, guidelines have been developed to tackle this issue. Work is now underway to enable the delivery of cyber-resilient ships, which can be cyber-secure all their operational lives. Although good progress has been made on maritime safety here in the EU, many challenges still remain. But whatever the future brings, safety will always remain at the heart of the maritime transport sector. Now for a more detailed look at the report's findings and analysis, please welcome its lead author and our colleague here at EMSA, Santiago Encabo, Senior Project Officer for Ship Safety and Marine Equipment. So thank you very much. Um, actually, it is for me really an honor and a pleasure to be here today presenting the first European Maritime Safety Report. When our executive director challenged the safety department to prepare this report, we knew that we would have a hard but interesting work ahead of us. So maritime safety, as you know, is a very broad topic. However, we had the advantage to count with the successful experience of our colleagues in the Environmental Department, who successfully managed to launch the MTER report last year. So we put together a task force formed by EMSA, staff members with different backgrounds, different expertise, and well, as they are here today, I take the, well, they are very modest they are in the last row, uh, but I take the opportunity to thank them for their commitment, contribution, and I have to say patience to, uh, well, to get the deadlines, the tight deadlines that sometimes we had to, to achieve. The result of this work is the document that you have in your hands today. When we started the work, we found really a lot of information about maritime safety, but actually scattered through different reports and actually a lot of data available spread through different databases. I mean, as you can see here, we like a lot the, the acronyms, no? Thetis, which is Port Safety Control, Safety Net. Uh, it's about traffic monitoring, MED, marine equipment, MSIP, accidents. SCCW information system about the seafarers, 30CU, Marinfo. So that made clear for us that the main objective of MSAFE should be extracting the main information from all these sources, analyzing it and presenting it in a horizontal way, in a holistic manner, to give a picture and overview of the maritime safety in the EU. Our executive director and our health department, Leonard, also insisted from the very beginning that to make this report meaningful, we needed to embark, we needed to cooperate with our stakeholders. And I have to say that indeed the consultation with all these parties that you are representing here today enriched the report significantly. We had a general written consultation we had bilateral exchanges, we had meetings, and above all, we had a very interesting uh, consultation workshop in January with almost 200 participants. I would like to thank here today, all of you, for your participation and contribution, and especially, of course, to the European Commission, the EMOVE, Member States Administrations, the European Transport Workers Federation, ETF, European Community Ship Owners Association, EXA, International Association of Classification Societies, IX, 
the Shipyards and Marine Equipment Association, Sea Europe, the International Association of Independent Tanker Owners, Intertanko, the International Union of Marine Insurance, UMI, and the Cruise Lines International Association, CREA, and finally, the Waterborne Technology Platform. So really, thanks to all of you for your contribution to this report and that really enriched its content and conclusions. I will go now a bit to the substance of the research and analysis that is included in this report. I've changed a bit the structure to what is in the, in the report to make it easier for this, for this slot that we have. But as you know, our maritime safety system is based on different defense lines. The first being the flag state, which is responsible, as you know, for implementing the standards on the ships, the flag. In the case of the European Union, we are talking about a fleet of 13,000 ships which is around 17% of the, of the world fleet. And we are talking also about 17, sorry, 75,000 fishing vessels that have to be managed. Obviously, the resources needed to manage such a fleet in terms of inspections, new builds, modifications, certification, etc., are considerable. And we have heard today from some administrations that this is being really a problem. Therefore, more and more, the administrations are delegating this task to recognized organizations, or ROs, as we commonly refer to, which, as you know, are classification societies working, if I can say that, with a different hat. And the report found that around 80%, already 80% of the surveys and two thirds of the certificates are already delegated to the ROs. So, I will not say that the flag states are disappearing, but actually what is clear is that there is a transfer of experience, a transfer of technical knowledge from the flags to the ROs. This is neither bad nor good. This is just a fact. This is what is happening, and probably this will increase even more. It is also known, and it has been reported to the IMO by several port state control memorandum of understandings like Paris, Tokyo, that unfortunately not all the classification societies are delivering their performance with the same quality level. In fact, in the EU, only 12 class societies out of around 95 with known activity in the world are recognized. All of them, as you know, all of them but one belong to, to IAX. This means that it's more important than ever to continue having a centralized and a strong system of recognition in the EU, because all the work, all the safety work, now is concentrated in these organizations. In fact, the research made indicates that during the EMSA regular inspections to the EU ROs, around 2,500 deficiencies have been found in 300 visits in these 20 years. In addition, the IMSAS, which is the IMO audit system of administrations, has found more than 200 shortcomings in the audits they do in relation to delegation of authority from the flag to the RO. So this is an issue really to be. In conclusion, although we can be sure that we have the top world-class societies organizations recognized in the EU, which by the way, manage also the majority of the world fleet. MSAFE reveals that there is still work to be done and the task of inspecting the inspectors, as our first executive director used to say, is essential to ensure a proper functional of this first line of defense. There are more details about this in the report, of course. The second line of defense is the poor state control system 
um, and M safe shows that in the EU in 2020, which is, as you know, the, the strongest year in terms of the pandemics of the COVID-19, we had almost half a million port calls. Practically a quarter of them from ships flagged out of the EU. So in view of these numbers, the inspections of the ships calling here is a key element to ensure that substandard shipping is kept out of our coasts. And as you know, the system divides the flags according to their safety records in three categories, white, gray, and black. And you can see in this graph that the research made shows that a positive trend. So we can see that the number of gray and blacklisted flagships calling at the EU is decreasing year by year. So this is something I think we can be happy about. In addition, I think what it has to be recognized is the Herculean effort that the poor state administration are doing to keep the system alive with more than 14,000 annual inspections. I think yesterday was the Director General, uh, Mr. Holloway, who was mentioning that the time of the, the big incidents, the like Prestige Erika, uh, fortunately no, passed, passed away at least for 20 years, we didn't have any, any accidents on, of, this, of this size. Uh, but I think a lot of, of, the, of, of, the, of the merit has to be given to these inspectors that are really in these in this sometimes small ports and anonymous ports really doing a very good work keeping these ships out of our ports. As you can see, most of the efficiencies found in the port state control are safety related, about 56% in particular to the SOLAS Convention, and almost 25% are related to the human element, a topic that has been brought up in this conference uh, quite often. I have to say that the majority of these human element deficiencies have to do with the working conditions on board ships, something that also was, was discussed yesterday. And another positive trend that we found in the report is that the number of detentions is decreasing, showing a continuous improvement in safety by the industry. So I think this is also something uh, I would say good news to, to know. Then what I have called here the third line of defense is something really very specific for the EU. Because as you know, in the European Union, in addition to the international instruments, sometimes there are some specific legislation dealing with particular aspects of our transport, for example, ROPAX, which is an essential element of our economy. So actually, in this respect, the visits that EMSA does to verify the implementation of the EU acquis are really very important. You can see the numbers here. So more than 300 visits on EU legislation, 70 inspections on STCW, and 300 are on inspection. In the report, you can find, of course, a more detailed analysis about the findings that have been found, the horizontal things that have been found in, this, in these inspections with, with more detail. I think the average is around 35 visits per year, which means three per month. So another thing to consider here is that the visits cannot be restricted to the EU, to the European Union. Also, we heard yesterday how much influence we are by, 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 by decisions taken elsewhere, no? because they can have really an impact on us. So this map shows a bit the, the global reach of the, of the EMSA visits to really enforce the EU legislation. So the EU legislation is not really restricted to the EU, let's say. So it affects really the, the, global, the global market. However, despite all these defense lines, accidents persist. On average, around 3,200 accidents are reported to MSIP every year. In terms of severity of the accidents, 
MSA found that around 70% of the accidents are less serious or just incidents, meaning that only the 30% are serious and very serious. And as you can see in the graph, the very serious, fortunately, are, um, have a very low expression in this distribution. With regard to fatalities, there seems to be a decreasing trend. So in this graph, you can see the seven-year trend for the fatalities. And I think it's, it's clear that we are also in the good path in this, in this regard. In addition, well, you can find much more details of the report in the report about this. In any case, in view of these figures, a safety net, a response system, is still needed in the EU. Both the places of refuge and the search and rescue systems both manage and under the direct responsibility of the member states are essential pillars of this net. In this graph, we can see the number of search and rescue operations reporting to the European Maritime Casualty Information Platform. As you can see, Unfortunately, the fishing vessels are consistently the number one in this category. So they are the ships with, with more need to be rescued. But well, yesterday in the, in the dinner, we had a very interesting talk about football. And actually, it was we were discussing that the best defense is always a good attack. So actually, to ensure a safe maritime transport, we cannot be only reactive. We should address the challenges that we have in front of us. The MSAFE analyzed the information and data available and also all your input that really was very interesting, especially for this part on the challenges. So here I will summarize only some of them. This morning, we had a very interesting panel about innovation. It was, I think, very, very, very interesting. But I think we cannot forget what we have already sailing on our seas, because this, the ships, is not, is not an asset that you can change in a couple of years. They stay there for a couple of decades. So we have also to see what we have now in our backyard. What are the challenges? I will start with the aging of the passenger fleet, which is the oldest of all the relevant ship categories. At the same level as the world fleet, the average of the world, of the world passenger fleet is around 27 years, which means that there are still many ships sailing in our waters with more than 40 years built according to very old safety standards. This results in ships operating in the same routes with very different safety levels. Another issue found in the report is the risk of fires, both in raw packs, as we have seen unfortunately in recent accidents, and in large container ships, which have proven very difficult to detect and extinguish. Still, on container ships, the losses of containers is an issue to consider. The third issue is obviously the fishing vessels, which I would say continues to be the elephant in the room that nobody really wants to address or, or can address or is not easy to address. Let's put it in this way. I, I, I change my words. It's not that nobody wants, it's, it's really it's difficult to address. They are the most vulnerable type of ships to accidents, as the report demonstrates. Yeah. And finally, the increase in size of passenger ships and the new routes in more remote areas, like the Arctic, for example, raise questions about whether we are prepared to manage a massive rescue an evacuation operation from these ships. You can find more information, more data about this, how this is demonstrated in the, in the, in the report, of course. 
but as we saw this morning, also shipping is not static. It's always moving and in progress. So what we should also see what's coming. Huh? Um, many of you in your comments highlighted the importance that we could see today you know, in the panel as well. The importance of the consequences that the digitalization process and the increasing automation on board ships can bring to the sector. This process can end up with the transfer of crew of seafarers from sea to shore to remote control centers, or even end up with pure autonomous ships, although this remains to be seen in practice whether it will be possible. Sometimes one has the feeling that the technology is not really the barrier, but probably here we are talking about something more complex, the framework, the way we do things in shipping probably has to change. In addition, the digitalization comes with very interesting associated possibilities, like the facilitation of the reporting formalities, so all the bureaucracy that has to be carried out in the, in the ports through the single windows, the opportunity to adopt e-certifications and eliminate the paper certificates, the implementation of electronic tax on marine equipment to facilitate the market surveillance and reduce the installation of substandard equipment on board ships, among some other things. Obviously, this will change step by step the way we do things. Another big challenge that has been, of course, uh, highlighted here, uh, and with probably more immediate implications than the automation, has to do with decarbonization. This process has been embraced by the whole EU maritime industry, and the search for more sustainable solutions to propel and power ships, either through electrification or with the use of alternative fuels, has very important consequences on the safety of the ship. For example, a couple of days ago, uh, unfortunately, a ship, a Spanish ship, uh, Spanish fishing vessels, had an explosion on board due to ammonia. Of course, ammonia used for refrigeration purposes, which is something that is being used on fishing vessels for years, but it had a, a big explosion with two fatalities and 18 in injured people. So we can imagine the consequences. If we have ammonia massively used as fuel on board ships, this is not something to be taken lightly. So we, we have to address the safety challenges of these alternative fuels. So in most cases, standards must still be developed to fully, adopt, to fully adopt some technologies, which in the meantime are implemented with tailor-made risk analysis or on a case-by-case -case basis, which is not the ideal solution in the long term as it can pave the way to have ships with very different level of safety operating. But given the urgency of the matter, the adoption of cleaner technologies cannot wait. So we must be really fast and efficient in addressing this issue from a safety perspective so that we are not the barrier for this adoption. And I left this slide for the end on purpose um, because in the middle of all these challenges, we have the human element. And we have seen that in the panels extensively, I would say. And we have seen in, the, in our analysis that the poor state control, as we said at the beginning, shows still problems with the working conditions of seafarers in the implementation. In addition, the automation and the introduction of this new powering system will require a lot of retraining in an already aging working force. Furthermore, we have seen during the pandemic the fragile position in which seafarers are, where on many occasions the crew change was impossible due to mobility restrictions so increasing fatigue for those on board. And in worst cases, there were some sick failures, sick seafarers that couldn't disembark to receive medical treatment, which led to very bad situations, of course. And finally, we all hope that the revisions of the STCW and the STCWF conventions will bring some improvement to seafarers. Otherwise, the attractivity of the sector may decrease. 
So just to finish, I think a nutshell, based on the research and consultation made with all of you, I would say that MSAFE summarized the main challenges and opportunities of the maritime safety in a holistic way. We hope that it can be useful for policymakers for consultation and reflection when dealing with safety issues. It compiles in a single place a large amount of information and data on specific safety issues, and it could become even a manual for newcomers if needed. To finish, I think this picture says it all. So that's it from my side. Thanks a lot for your attention. So I don't know if you have any, any question about this. Thank you. It was everything very clear, so. No questions from the audience? Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santiago. And now, ladies and gentlemen, to, to look, I suppose to look back and also to look ahead to the future of maritime safety in the EU, let me welcome back the Executive Director of EMSA, <laughs> Madam Maya Markovic Kostelak, to the stage. Thank you, Maya. Huh? Now. Uh, good morning, or yeah, good afternoon. Uh, after such an interesting presentation of the report by Santiago, there is not much to be added. Nevertheless, I would first uh, and above all wish to thank our AMSA team for developing this uh, first of that kind, a comprehensive, full European Maritime Safety Report um, under the wise guidance of Santiago, the full team really did a good job. So thank you very much. Good job done. I would also like to thank uh, all our colleagues and partners from the Commission to the industry side. You have seen the full list. This is why the report is so comprehensive and well structured because we had a partnership um, which is demonstrated in, in practice. Um, it is very, very important to, to mention that, as it has been stated in the report itself, we are sailing uh, in the much safer environment than uh, the one we were facing uh, two or three decades ago. Nevertheless, that does not uh, give us the opportunity to relax, because as maritime transport uh, is dynamic, as uh, is dynamic it is, and the safety challenges or environment in which we, uh, we are operating. So we have to be prepared always to address new challenges. As you have seen in this report, there are some areas which has been identified as, let's say, more risky. Name, fishing vessels. So we are planning here in EMSA to join forces with our colleagues from EFCA to address these issues and uh, to discuss and see how we can better, let's say, facilitate the safety path of the fishing uh, fleet in Europe, but also, of course, its environmental context. Um, large passenger ship um, uh, evacuation and search and rescue operations, we are thinking of using the opportunity of the uh, mass operations to actually exercise and train together with our colleagues from the member states the operation in practice. Container ship and fire on board the container ships. Cargo declaration is one of the issues that has been identified as a possible um, areas for the improvement, lashing, and of course the marking uh, of the containers in the larger and broader scope. 
But in the heart of all our activities, as it has been mentioned during both uh, panels and uh, during Santiago's uh, presentation, people, human element. We all know it is still the highest contributing factor to, to the casualties um, on board the sea, so we have to take care not just uh, from the training and um, education side, but also and above all from living and working conditions on board the vessels. Repatriation is safety, living and working conditions are safety. These are the elements that strongly influence the uh, safety on board the vessels. We were discussing uh, today how are we going to adapt our way of operation to the new challenges and new opportunities. Because I always say, the, when we talk about the safety, we usually uh, use the word challenge. Nevertheless, I strongly believe that investments in uh, safety is actually the investments in competitiveness. And that is uh, based on, the, let's say, accelerating the culture of safety. The culture of safety which really uh, pay off the investments in safety towards the more environmentally friendly and more safe um, maritime environment all, all in all. When it comes to new opportunities, I will call it that way, which comes with the decarbonization, we are always um, considering that decarbonization has the other part of the coin, and this is safety. Any promising technology has to pass, let's say, the test of uh, safety, because absolutely we cannot talk about the promising technology if we don't, if it is not safety proofed. There is no security without safety, so basically this is the cornerstone of all the activities uh, for the future. What is also very important is that uh, we see both parts of our maritime sector. So we are talking mostly, we are EMSA, we are talking mostly about shipping. But the port side and ship port interface is something that needs to be addressed uh, in the holistic and comprehensive way. So safety of ships and safety of ports are the part of the same family of topics and, and of subjects. Digital solutions are one of the tools that could raise the safety. It has also, of course, we all know its, uh, its challenges. Uh, where we see the greatest potential is, of course, to reduce the administrative burden of maritime transport, to reduce the um, elements of the reporting in shipping and in port sector. But it also has the opportunity in the in addressing uh, safety, in addressing safety issue. That of course means that uh, we are opening uh, the industry to what has today been called high tech, which needs again a new expertise. But it also raised the attractiveness and as it uh, has been said uh, after the second panel, it raised also the opportunity to strengthen the gender balance in our sector, which would leads to the race of the attractiveness and altogether will make uh, our, our uh, shipping even more safe. Um, so these issues we are going to continue to address uh, through the activities of EMSA in cooperation with all of you. Uh, although in last years, of course, we are very much concentrating on the, digit on the uh, sustainable transformation of merit and transport, I can assure you that safety remains the cornerstone of all our activities and all our efforts, and this is where we are going to continue to sail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya, for concluding this part in presenting MSAFE, which I believe is going to be one of the most downloaded documents on our website. By the way, since 34 minutes, it's also available on our website. So if you want to further promote it with your contact, please do it. And we now move into the concluding address session. And for that, I have the honor to invite to the stage Mr. Antonio Costa Silva, Minister of Economy and the Sea of Portugal.
Good morning. I would like to express my greetings to ministers, Secretary of State, to the Executive Director of ENSA, Maja Kostelak. This time I pronounced well your name. <laughs> I am improving. <laughs> I, I would like also to thank the European entities, especially the Directorate for Transport and Mobility, for the organization of this conference. I would like also to congratulate ENSA for the 20th anniversary. I think uh, it has been developing a fantastic job. We need safety in our maritime transport across the world. We are witnessing today huge geopolitical changes. Uh, some reconfiguration of the supply chains. My I strongly believe that the oceans will be the main support for all the world trade. And the 90% of the world trade is, do, is done by the oceans. This will be a cornerstone still for the future. And uh, it is uh, undeniable that the maritime transport is the backbone of the world trade. And this will continue. But in order to do that, we need to modernize all the maritime transport system and we need also to preserve the health of our oceans. And don't be mistaken, if we look to the health of the oceans, it has been deteriorating at an amazing pace and this creates a lot of concerns for the future. This is why in a few days' time we will be held in, in Lisbon the conference, the United Nations Conference for the Oceans. And as we are discussing within the European Union, the new mandate for ENSA, I think ENSA has done fantastic achievements for the maritime transport, for the safety, even for dealing with the flux of uh, migrants. But there are other areas linked to the decarbonization, to the modernization of the maritime transport system with the digital transformation of all this system and also the preservation of the health of the oceans. And if we look to the oceans, still today, each year, we are depositing in the, air, in the oceans 11 million tons of plastics. And there is the pollution, not only the maritime pollution, but also the acidification and the strongly effect that is has in the ecosystems across all the oceans. And if you lose biodiversity in our oceans, and the oceans are the home of 90% of the world biodiversity, this will affect the human species in the future. In order to stabilize the health of the oceans, we need also to change the fuels that drive the maritime transport. And so the decarbonization with new fuels Hydrogen, ammonia, methanol is crucial for the future. We are very glad with the partnership between ENSA and the Portuguese government, the Portuguese entity, especially the GRM and Engineer Simão, which is uh, cooperating uh, day to day with ENSA. We would like to, to, uh, to, in, to enlarge this cooperation. In the, we have a plan for the port of Sins in Portugal to develop the cluster of hydrogen, methanol and ammonia. This will be the transition fuels for, uh, for the future. There will be uh, uh, no em emission emitters of uh, CO2. They can provide a strong basis to develop uh, this transformation. And so we would like to, to close and to extend this partnership in order to change the health of the maritime uh, system and also the health of the oceans. If we look to the programs of the European Union, the 50 for 55 has strong recommendations in terms of the maritime transport and uh, the content on sulfur and other issues related with uh, the deployment of the, of, the, of the fleets in the ocean. I think we have to take this on board and assume through action plans to reconfigure it the transportation system and going ahead with that. In terms of the digitalization, I strongly believe that uh, this will increment in terms of gains of efficiency, optimization of the fleets, optimization of the trips, optimization of all the chain, of all the supply chain with effects across in terms of declining emissions. So we have uh, very important uh, challenges ahead. It's up to us to take collective action. Sometimes we fail in terms of collective actions. We held conferences, but after the action programs are not 
uh, according to the ideas and to the plans that we devise. I think this is very important, not only for the transport system, it's important for the climatic system on Earth and the oceans as they cover 70% of the surface of the planet. They are responsible for 90% of the biodiversity. They provide 14% of food. They provide 50% at least of the oxygen that we need. We need to, say, to pay a strong attention to that. And uh, I hope that in the new mandate for ENSA, all these activities can be also incorporated in order to enlarge the scope of activities and the work together for changing the situation, not only of the ocean, but also to modernize all the maritime transport. All the efforts that are done regarding these issues are crucial and they should gain more weight in terms of making this transformation. In my view, the core of this transformation is the energy transition and hydrogen will play a key role on that. Hydrogen is the most abundant gas in the universe, is very versatile, can compete in mobility, not only for the maritime transport, also with transport uh, in, in cities or uh, trucks for uh, long, uh, long trips that they travel each day. It can be used as a storage uh, fuel as well. And the combination of hydrogen with the other fuels, mainly methanol and ammonia, green ammonia, can be a way for the future. So I wish to answer in the news, new 20 years that start from now, all the success. And thank you very much, Maja, for the work done till now. Thank you. Muito obrigado, Sr. Ministro. Uh, and now we move on with the final concluding address from Ms. Maya Kompi Magda Kompicka, Ma uh, Maritime Director from the European Commission. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Andra. You, you never know whether it's final. It all depends on what I'm going to say, because maybe I say something that all of you will rush to stage to correct me, but maybe not, because there's a cocktail reception uh, waiting, so I think that could limit everybody's interest in uh, disagreeing with me. Uh, dear ministers, dear Maya, dear friends, dear EMSA colleagues, it's, it's quite difficult to offer concluding remarks after 24 hours like this. I need to say and start by saying big thanks for the reception yesterday. It was as good as 20 years of EMSA. So, nice. Right. But if some of you thought that we come here and we just celebrate. Uh, I hope you were proven wrong because I believe we've had quite a few very interesting discussions. And I don't mean those over coffee and over drinks, but those that took place in this room. We started yesterday with looking at a bit into the future of shipping and challenges towards that future. And we really talked a lot about the importance of seafarers and about the importance of making sure that shipping remains attractive for young people. Because if we don't have people in shipping, we don't have shipping at all. And it was quite reassuring to hear ministers and, NG and industry representatives, NGOs, social partners, to actually agree that this is an important topic. I'm not sure we are yet there in terms of full agreement what we can do together to improve attractiveness of, of shipping, to make sure the young people dream of coming on board of vessels. But I know we'll get there also with the help of EMSA. But uh, it was also interesting to hear quite a few, and in particular politicians, saying that shipping is a conservative industry. And that I find a challenge because I think conservative industries nowadays don't survive. So we need to find a way to make shipping more innovative. And that was the panel of today. And when, when we talk about innovation, we talk about different instruments for that innovation. And as a 
proper Commission official, I hear what I like to hear. So what I heard today uh, in the panel is that a good regulatory framework is actually conducive to regulation, but it needs to be the right regulatory framework that is well prepared and then properly implemented and enforced. And if we look at the challenges of today, such as environmental protection, climate crisis, I continue to be proud of the Fit for 55 package with fuel EU proposal, ETS. They will be the right regulatory framework to push for decarbonisation, even more so that we will be pushing European Commission, EU member states, with the help of EMSA, to make sure that this framework agreed at European level will be taken up at the IMO level so that we have a global solid regulatory framework that will live up to the challenge of climate uh, crisis and decarbonisation. But we talk about safety because of the uh, new report that some of us will carry in our bags and others will carry in our iPads, which is lighter, uh, back home. And it's so good to hear that and so good to know that safety does remain the core topic that we have to be looking into. And it was a very, very interesting overview from Santiago showing how many things are done, but how many things still need to be done in future to make sure that shipping first and foremost remains safe. Talking again about regulatory framework, the new safety package that we are working on, the preparation for the revision of fishing vessels uh, safety should provide additional incentive to make sure that both member states and industry know what needs to be done to make sure that shipping remains safe. And a lot, of course, has been said over those two, those two days about the role of EMSA. And it's so good to hear that we all agree that EMSA is the bridge builder, the place where good ideas come together, where even better people come together to work and develop instruments that will allow that regulatory framework, those good concepts to become reality. And it will be important for, for EMSA, it was important for EMSA for 20 years in the past, it will be important for EMSA for 20 years to come and even more to make sure that all those challenges, green transition, innovation, digitalization, safety, that they will be properly instrumentalized, operationalized in a way that works for everybody. I liked what Lendert said, Lendert said in, the, in, the, in the panel when he used the words that EMSA is a neutral ground. And I think it's, 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 it's a good description of, of, of EMSA being the, the center of knowledge and expertise and being able to bring different people and different in, interests on board. And I promise I'm almost done. But I need to just make a small side comment, slightly going away from 20 years, but not quite, because everybody, uh, we all have been saying on many occasions today and before that shipping is the key element of global economy and that the global economy and wealth cannot exist without shipping. But shipping cannot exist without the world. And shipping needs a safe and stable world. And we don't have such a world today. But what we got today, approximately one hour ago, was decision by the European Commission to grant candidate status to Ukraine and Moldova and to also uh, open the perspective for, for EU membership to Georgia. And I know that uh, countries that got this con candidate status today will hear it will take many years before you make it to an EU member. Poland got candidate status in April 1994 and in May 2004 we were a member of the EU. So all I can say since we talk a lot about uh, family, welcome to the European family. Thank you. Thank you very much, Magda, for these nice words. And now, finally, to conclude our conference, I will call on the stage our executive director, Ms. Maya Markovic Kostelac, for the final words. Thank you, Maya. Thank you. <clears throat> this was a very, very optimistic message from, uh, from Magda. So we also want to uh, join Ukraine uh, in, to our family. They already are in many parts of our activities for the neighboring country, and this will now be even strengthened. 
Um, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, it was really great to have you uh, here with us um, in EMSA these two days. We were celebrating, but we were also chartering. We were thinking about how to steer this uh, important um, organization into next at least 20 years and above. So we were listening carefully to what uh, both the member states, but also our uh, colleagues from other um, organizations in EU and industry said. And I, in particular, um, like the sentence said by the Cypriot minister yesterday, um, non-fossil fuel for maritime sector. This is a new definition for EMSA. And I can, um, I can entrust you that we are ready to absorb uh, more tasks. We are ready to uh, serve maritime safety and maritime decarbonization processes in the decades to come. We are ready to be on your side and to provide the platform for discussion under, as it has been said, neutral, but I would say neutral, but engaged territory in this house. So uh, with this, I wish you all safe journey uh, back home. Return soon to this beautiful city of Lisbon. Return soon, you directly and your experts to a number of our activities. Uh, which we are going to organize together with all of you and uh, with our partners from the IMO, which I didn't mention enough as I should. Uh, welcome again. I'm already looking forward to our 25th anniversary, which uh, is going to be only in five years' time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maya. And this really brings us to the end of these two very interesting days. I would like to thank, on behalf of all EMSA staff, all of you who have attended and present here in Lisbon, as well as the one that we're connecting throughout these two days online on YouTube. I also greet you there.